Council Planning Committee. It's an extraordinary planning committee dated the 18th of May. Um, <clears throat> first, firstly, obviously, this is our first planning committee meeting, uh, physical planning committee meeting, or I guess we should call it a hybrid meeting because many other people are joining us remotely, including many of the presenters and people who wish to speak. Um, so please bear with us. We, we hope we've got all the technical issues addressed. But uh, as with anything, when we're the first to be doing it, there may be some minor issues which we hope we can resolve quite quickly. So um, if I can just go through a few procedural issues to remind people. Um, the meeting tonight, as I say, is a hybrid. Uh, the members of the planning committee are here physically in person, but most others are joining us remotely. The planning committee... Uh, currently consists of 10 elected members, borough councillors, and we're supported here tonight by a variety of officers. And uh, those officers who are physically present is on my left, Callum Wernham, who is the Democratic Services Officer and Clerk to this committee. Um, Anne Hunter, Madeline Shopland and Neil Carr are also supporting the meeting. Uh, officers who will be presenting this evening will be doing so, as I say, remotely. And the officers that will be here this evening uh, presenting or uh, answering questions are Connor Corrigan, the Service Manager for Planning and Delivery, Andrew Fletcher, the Green Infrastructure Manager, Emmy Circuit, the Delivery Manager for South Wokingham and Wokingham Town Centre, Judy Kelly, the Highways Development Manager, Chris Easton, the Head of Transport, Drainage and, and Compliance, Mark Cupid, who's the Assistant Director for Delivery and Infrastructure, Mary Severin, the Borough Solicitor, and the other officers will be presenting uh, include Jean Malovey, who will be presenting on the highways application. Um, so, uh, the, as, I, as I said earlier, um, the meetings tonight will follow the normal pattern. Uh, but, as you know, this is a quasi-judicial meeting with formal and set procedures that I'd ask you to comply with. Um, and firstly, the planning officer will present the application. And then I will in turn call only those, Stephen, um, I'm sorry, I wasn't quite sure when to speak, uh, Chairman, uh, but I understand that this is your last meeting, and I just wanted to uh, record the thanks of the committee. I'm sure my colleagues would support me in this uh, for your chairmanship, very fair minded chairmanship over a long period of time. I'm sure we're all going to miss uh, you as chairman very much. Thank, thank you very much. <clears throat> um, as I say, when people come to speak tonight, because of these, these applications are all invariably interlinked in some way, we've chosen to allow speakers to combine their time so that they can address more aspects of the application. As you're aware, normally we have three minutes from each category of speaker on each application. But tonight, there's in, in various cases, speakers have agreed that they wish to combine their time. And I would just remind you that whilst your time may be combined, that combined time is still the target that we need to try and conclude your, your uh, contribution by. Um, as I say, members, are, uh, members of the committee are interested with the speakers have to say, but of course they're particularly interested in the, quant the quality rather than necessarily the quantity of what you have to say. Only those who are pre-registered to speak may speak. No one else, including borough councillors, town or parish councillors, agents, applicants, uh, objectors, supporters, are permitted to address the committee, ask questions or interrupt or disrupt the meeting. Following the planning officer's presentation, members of the committee will uh, discuss and debate the application in question and seek clarification, uh, hopefully reach a decision. And that clarification will be provided by the council's professional planning officers. The decisions we reach may or may not agree with those of the officer's recommendation. Finally, just a reminder that it is our role to determine any valid planning application using prevailing local and national planning policies or previous binding decisions of the planning independent planning inspectorate. Our role is not to suggest alterations to schemes, whether they are a good idea, whether they're needed, whether they are too costly, whether there are alternative uses. So please, if we now move straight on to the agenda, I would just remind you, because people are joining us remotely, unless you've pressed the button on the microphone, people will not be able to hear what you have to say other than those of us in the chamber, and then you'll probably be rather faint. So please try and um, remember to do that. 
So coming on to apologies, we only have apologies from uh, Councillor Cowan for this evening. Uh, do we have any declarations of interest? Right, uh, Pauline Organson first. Thank you, Chairman. I'd like to declare a prejudicial interest in the two highways applications, 203535 and 192928. As Executive Member for Highways and Transport, I have, no, I have had no involvement with the planning applications or the details of the scheme or the design, but I have spoken to both objectors and supporters as to the way to solve the problems that, that they've raised. I've therefore been advised not to take part in the decisions for these two applications this evening. Okay, thank you. Um, Councillor Ross. <coughs> thank you, Chairman. Um, I just want to note that um, three of the supplementary planning documents mentioned on the number of these applications uh, were signed by me back in 2010 and 2011. And just to note that that is 10 years ago uh, and that I've taken no part uh, because of that uh, since with those uh, policies which have obviously been related to the applications. Okay, thank, thank you very much. So we now come on to the substantive uh, items and the first item we, <clears throat> we're going to take is application 192928 which is relates to footpath diversions uh, that are connected with another application that we'll be discussing later this evening and hopefully now everything will work. Yeah, no applications yes there are no applications to be withdrawn just to confirm that. So. Hello, thank you, Chair. This, uh, this item seeks approval from the Planning Committee for five separate changes to the public rights of way network in the South Wokingham area. And these are the diversion of Wokingham Footpath 24 and Wokingham Footpath 9, the stopping up of part of Wokingham Footpath 25, stopping up of part of Wokingham Without Footpath 10, diversion of part of Wokingham Without Footpath 5 at East Hampstead Road and the stopping up of part of Wokingham Without Footpath 5 at Waterloo Road. If we could just go to the next slide, please. Here is a, an overview of where these paths sit. Um, on the left, we can see Wokingham Footpath 25 just to the right of that, there's the diversion of footpath, Wokenham footpath 24, Wokenham without footpath 9. Again, moving to the right, Wokenham footpath 10, and then right further to the, the uh, far right of the page, there's the partial stopping up diversion of Wokenham footpath 5 um, there. Um, I know it's, uh, so the changes to the first four of these are to facilitate the development of the South Wokenham Distributor Road. Under the Town and Country Planning Act 1990, the diversion and stopping up orders can be made in anticipation of planning permission, but they would not take effect until planning permission was granted. The last application on the very far left is to stop up part of Wokenham without footpath 5 at Waterloo Road. This is to facilitate the Eastern Gateway development, which was granted planning permission on the 19th of February 2019. If we could just go to the next slide, please. Here we are. So this slide shows the extent of the proposed stopping up of Wokenham Footpath 25. The reason for the stopping up is because the line of the proposed South Wokenham Distributor Road will run over this section of the existing path, and it causes the path to cross the new road at two separate occasions in uh, quite a short uh, space of time. Instead, path users can use the three metre wide shared cycleway on either side of the road as an alternative. And I have uh, marked out an alternate route in orange there. And the new path will be accessible all year round. Uh, this one will be necess uh, necessary to, uh, if the proposed South Welcome to Suta Road uh, permission was granted. Can we just go to the next slide, please? This slide shows the extent of the diversion of Wokenham Footpath 24 and Wokenham Without Footpath 9. The diversion of the path and the delivery of the boardwalk is a requirement of the pedestrian and cycle strategy of the strategic development location. However, it can be most uh, delivered most efficiently as part of the South Wokenham Distributed Road project. 
The, divi the, divi the, the diversion would create a new crossing of the Embrook, meeting modern standards of the height of the bridge and the flow of the water underneath. It's a significant improvement to the existing path and bridge and will also allow for cycle use. The path would be surfaced and available for use all year round, save for larger flood events where an alternative path up onto the South Wokenham Distributor Road would be available. Just go to the next slide, please. This slide shows the existing bridge along the footpath, which is approximately one metre wide with two concrete stiles at either end. The stiles in particular prevent access to most mobility restricted users and research undertaken by the Ramblers found that only 50% of the population is able to climb a stile. The replacement structure, however, is a four metre wide boardwalk and bridge which provides access along the path and also into the wider Sang area to the south. The bridge design is similar to that used elsewhere in the borough and is accessible for mobility restricted users such as those in wheelchairs. Next slide, please. The next path to uh, proposal is the partial stopping up of Wokenham for path 10 and partial renumbering of that path. The reason for the stopping up is to facilitate the design requirements of the distributor road for a crossing point at 90 degrees to the road and it eliminates the need for the public to cross the road at an angle. It also avoids the duplication and conflict between the two highway records uh, which is the definitive map of public rights of way and the list of streets or the adopted highways. As this will sever the line of footpath 10, the northern section of the path will need to be renumbered. Next slide please. The first proposed change at Wokenham without footpath 5 is the diversion of the western section at East Hampstead Road. The diversion will move the footpath to meet the edge of the new adopted highway, which is a little bit further back than the existing line. But members of the public will have an adopted footway to walk along once they leave the definitive line of the path. Once again, this eliminates the need for the public to walk across the road junction of the proposed new road and avoids the duplication and conflict between the highway records. Next slide, please. The last proposed change is the stopping up of part of Wokenham without for Path 5 at Waterloo Road. This is to facilitate the eastern gateway development and moves the termination point of the path back to meet the edge of the new adopted highway. This is quite a minor change, but it avoids the duplication and conflict between the highway records. Members of the public will be able to walk further from this path along the footways being constructed as part of the eastern gateway. An informal consultation has been undertaken for all of these changes and the executive member, ward members, Wokenham Without Parish Council and Loddon Valley Ramblers have raised no objection to the proposals. Wokenham Town Council have stated that they did not see anything of concern in the proposals but sought reassurance that there would be access for horse riders and that cycling and pedestrian access would be segregated. On these points, I've responded to Wokenham Town Council that horse access was not possible along the paths as the design of the path and the bridges would not be able to cater for the height requirements for equestrian use. However, I have discussed the issue with the British Horse Society representative locally, who explained that the desired area that horse riders are seeking to get to is Gorick Woods to the south and not north through these paths to the sound centre. There is not currently any rights of access along these paths on horseback, so the proposed changes do not make the situation worse in terms of horse use. And with regard to the segregation of path users, I have responded to Wokenham Town Council that the routes are not planned to include segregation. Thank you. The uh, final point I want to make is uh, the recommendation to the committee is to approve the making of these five orders. Okay, um, thank you very much. Uh, we just have one person registered to speak on this application, and that's uh, Councillor Maria G from uh, speaking on Working Council, Working Borough Council. Uh, Maria, are you able? Hello. Yeah, just a moment. Can we? Can we? Um, uh, Andrew, could we stop sharing the screen, please? Turn down my microphone as well, so hopefully that's a bit better. I mean, if I need to turn it up. That's fine. We we can hear and see you. Okay. Go ahead. Go ahead. 
Thank you. Um, there are many good things about the new footpath routes and the new development. Uh, the surfaces are better and the access for disabled residents is better, although I have a few concerns. Um, so I'd like um, the committee to address the following issues. All the paths join with the shared footpath and cycleway, which is potentially a good thing. Um, but the footpaths are not suitable for shared use. And in any case, they're not they're footways, not cycleways. It's not clear to me from DAS version two how cyclists are to be deterred from using the existing footpaths without also deterring wheelchair users. Uh, I see the staggered gates, but these are not much of a deterrent. And indeed, the proposed shared footpath and cycleway to Tesco has staggered gates. It's going to be very confusing, in my opinion, for cyclists to be allowed onto the shared footpath cycleway, but they're not allowed to use the footpaths that come off that cycleway. So is the committee convinced that the new designs are suitable for directing each type of path user? Um, in relation to FP24 and FP9, the use of a boardwalk isn't always suitable for wheelchair users in the winter and can be quite challenging for those using pushchairs. Um, before making changes to the existing network, I'd like the committee to look at the gaps between the boards um, and if they've been considered in relation to the sizes of wheels most commonly found in wheelchairs and pushchairs. Um, I'm concerned about the reference to the gap with in 5.4.3 DES2. Um, if anybody's ever been to Marlow, you'll know what I mean about um, the gap width there, if you've been there with a wheelchair. I'd like also confirmation that the surface will not become slippery in winter or that you've got additional friction on the surfaces, especially on the ramps. Um, there's a major deterrent in pedestrians using the new footpaths because of the lack of controlled crossings along the SWDR. Um, there's just one potential control crossing, as far as I can see, near the school. FPN, FPS, FP10 actually crosses the carriageway, but to access both sides, pedestrians have a crossing with a refuge. This crossing does not have a raised roadway, so priority is given to vehicles. Um, and to access FP24 and 25 from the south and the western gateway, there are two crossings to get through. Altogether, despite the potential for increased pedestrian use, the design of the SWDR places obstacles in the way of that use, particularly for young or cautious pedestrians. Um, so I'll just sum up. I would ask the committee if they are satisfied that the new network is the best design it can be before extinguishing or diverting the old paths. And if our public sector equality duties are met in the design of changes to footpaths, if not, then the plan should come back to the committee. Thank you. Right, um, thank you very much. <clears throat> Um, so I'll now uh, throw this open to members. Um, I just want to do, before we do so, just get clarification from Andrew Fletcher, uh, who presented on this, that uh, the issue about misuse or potential misuse of the part of these footpaths by cyclists, um, was it planned to have appropriate signage uh, where these join um, uh, shared surfaces? Thank you, Chair. Uh, the footpaths where they've changed particularly over the the bridges and further along um, was actually intended for shared use with cyclists so we're not looking to particularly uh, prevent cyclists from using them but actually on the contrary um, have permitted cycle use along these paths so, so what would their status be? Would it remain as a footpath with permissive use by cyclists? Is that what you're suggesting? Exactly. Yeah, that's, that's what we're yeah. looking to do. Okay. okay. Um, we also heard about concerns about the suitability of uh, boardwalk for uh, less able users or people with pushchairs or wheelchairs. Um, are we satisfied that the proposals that are before us are, meet the current standards that are applied nationally on footpaths? <laughs> Yes, I've um, uh, reviewed the current standards that we have for our own bridges that we use elsewhere in the borough and it is comparable to that and in some ways exceeds that. Um, and we've looked at the gradients on the boardwalk in terms of uh, dis disabled accessibility uh, and we're happy with the design would meet those you know, standards that we need. Okay, thank you. So we now come to members of the committee and I see um, Stephen Conway, uh, Andrew Mickleborough, Angus Ross and Rochelle shepherd Debay. So we'll take them in that order. Stephen? Lo local member first, Chair. Sorry, my apologies. Um, who should that be? Angus. It, Angus, is you speaking as local member? Yep. Uh, yes, okay, yes Chairman of Parliament. Um, I, I just um, wish to express how clearly much work has been done to ensure the continuity of the uh, public rights of way in this area 
uh, and uh, how it also takes account of the housing and road developments which we will be considering later this evening. Currently, footpaths 24, 9, 25 and 10 are well used and safety and access uh, will, I believe, be achieved uh, with the modifications that have been proposed. Footpath 5 is currently very seldom used um, because it, it doesn't really lead to anywhere that's safe at either end. Uh, but it will prove a useful piece of footway once the proposed housing is built and it does need to be retained and realigned as proposed. So I support this uh, proposal, this application, as does the Loddon Valley Ramblers, who are very active in studying any changes in public rights of way uh, and have, I know, studied this and had conversations with Andrew on this. Thank you, Chairman. Stephen Conway. Uh, thank you, Chairman. Um, Andrew, you were just talking uh, with the chairman about the, the question about shared use between pedestrians and cyclists, uh, and you're clearly uh, content that this is uh, acceptable. But I, we're going to hear, I, I suspect, quite a lot about LTN on stroke 20 um, this evening, uh, which does seem to encourage separation in order to try and ensure that there isn't any potential conflict between cyclists and pedestrians. We're obviously keen to maximise the number of people who are using means of transport other than the car, cycling or walking. Um, and uh, are you not concerned that there is a bit of a danger here that if we've not got clear separation between cyclists and pedestrians, uh, we may deter people from using uh, this new route. Andrew. Thank you, Chairman. The, um, you're absolutely correct that LTN 120 does encourage segregation, but uh, Section 828 of the LTN specifically in discourages the use of segregation on routes that are three metres wide or less. Um, instead, it favours um, a fully shared surface is preferable to creating substandard widths for both pedestrians and cyclists where the available width is three metres or less. This allows users to walk or cycle side by side and negotiate the space when passing. If we were to segregate a three metre wide path, it would only leave 1.5 metres for both types of user, which wouldn't be sufficient. So, thank you for that. The other point I wanted to raise was really about um, which is Councillor G, Maria G mentioned, which is about the surface of, of the, the walkways, the wooden walkways and, and the gaps between the slats and also um, how slippery that could be in winter. Are, are, are there steps that can be taken to ensure that this is going to be suitable for wheelchair and pushchair use? Thank you. Yes, the design of the structure is actually um, with timber decking with grooved boards, but also anti-slip inserts such as high grip XL boards, uh, which uh, provide um, the resistance required. The gaps between the slats are at an absolute maximum of 12 millimetres. Our own bridge standards for rights of way specify a 16 millimetre gap. So there's, it's actually wider on some of our other bridges elsewhere on bridleways and uh, footpaths than it is on this boardwalk. So I would, we don't have any um, complaints regarding accessibility on the other bridges that we have. So I'm um, satisfied that this would be uh, sufficient for use. Thank you. Um, next we have uh, um, Andrew McElbride. Yes, thank you, Chair. Um, and thank you, Andrew, for your presentation and for all the work that you've done in relation to this, as, uh, this application. Um, I have two short questions. Um, the first is, are there any reasons why any of the diverted footpaths might be more prone to flooding than the existing footpaths? And second, secondly, 
Um, I note the improved accessibility provided um, in some of these uh, proposals, uh, with the caveat that uh, Councillor G, G has raised some issues relating to FP9 and, um, and 25. Do any of the diversions add significantly to the distance that walkers um, and cyclists might face to the extent that this might discourage or hinder any of the users? Thank you. I'll um, cover the first question. I don't think any of the proposals will um, have an effect where there's there's more likelihood of any flooding. If anything, it's going to make it easier to use for most of the year and only during the the really severe flooding events is it likely to be a problem. Uh, and that would be for footpath 24 and nine. However, there's also an alternative path being put in as part of the proposals um, of, of the highway which means that people will be in a better position in those flood events than they are now. And um, if I could just come back to your other question, um, and I might need to ask you to repeat it. I'm sorry, I didn't take a note. Yeah, it's to do with um, uh, the distance um, of, the, uh, of the new paths. Do any of the diversions add significantly to the distance that users might face to an extent that it might actually discourage or hinder um, any of those users? Thank you. No, I don't think the, the uh, distance will be an issue for any of the users. Um, yeah, I don't think it would be a discouragement. Um, we're probably looking at maybe... 10 metres more at that at, um, at best and it's um, I don't think it would be a discouragement to anyone um, uh, Rochelle Shepard Dubay If you believe that cycle, jointly shared cycle paths are a good idea I'd like to invite you to come and take a walk with me down the Reading Road when the forest boys come out of school and uh, seeing how fast you can run across into the grass on the side of the road or having seeing mums pushing prams having to run across the road. Uh, I do believe a se segregated cycle path does work better. In Brighton, they have them. They have a slightly raised area which designates where the cycles are allowed and where the pedestrians are allowed. It works very, very well. I think that would be a much better idea than trying to play dodgems with the uh, cyclists. And some of the cyclists, especially on weekends, are rather um, more adventurous, shall we say. Andrew, did you have a response to that? I, they, I'm certainly not denying that there can be points where some cyclists are going fast, but one of the things I, I might make is that bridleways have had um, cycle use since the 1969 where so there's been horses and pedestrians and cyclists sharing the same space some of which is even narrower than three meters um, generally without any particular issue so it really depends on maybe the person or the, the cyclist um, or what goes on but um, and I, I agree that um, the, the pictures I've seen for cycleways in in Brighton have been very good but they've also used about three meters per person or two and a half meters per person so the land take is almost double or, or double of um, what we've got available here. Right thank you. Um, Councillor Abdul Lois. Thank you Chairman. Andrew is there a national legal set limit on the width of the footpath? Now we are talking about um, people using in one go say cyclers, prams, scooters, etc. Is the safety issue which I'm a bit concerned of? I can't advise too much on the uh, adopted highway standards. From a public rights of way perspective, there is no particular defined width for footpaths or bridleways. It all runs between historic widths. Um, there are particular standards that we try and achieve from the LTN in, when we put new things in. Um, but from a rights way perspective, there's nothing that says a footpath is X wide and things like that. It is a bit different when we're looking at um, normal highway schemes, however. Um, thank you. Um, Councillor Chris Barring. 
Thank you, Chen. Just to respond to Rochelle's point, we do have to uh, deliberate on the application before us, and I think Andrew's made it quite clear that with respect to non-segregated um, paths, that is, does conform to policy and should be accepted as such. And of course, these changes are necessary for the SWDR, should we um, eventually approve later today. Thank you. Uh, Councillor Carl Duran. Thank you, Chair. Um, yeah, I've just got one quick question. Um, the uh, Boardwalk Bridge um, certainly looks a better option than what, was there, what is there at the moment. Um, you sold that one very well with those two, two photos, I think. Um, I think you said it was four metres wide, and I've just been interested to know why, why is it four metres? Uh, on that front, I received the application and uh, had a look and made sure that the uh, the boardwalk is acceptable. But the reason why they've chosen that particular width, I may need to pass on to the designers on that front. I, I might I might hazard a guess that obviously a boardwalk has an edge, uh, and uh, it may be to give people a little bit more room uh, in those circumstances where there's actually a, a potential drop or potentially standing water during flooded periods at either side. I'm, that's a pure guess, I have to say. That. OK, I don't see any other members uh, indicating that they wish to speak on this. So, um, do mem firstly, do members wish to propose an alternative proposal from that that is in front of them tonight? Right, I see no one indicating. So, so therefore, members, you're being asked to, having, having heard the application and had a presentation on it, uh, that you're being asked to consider the recommendations. There are six of them. If I could refer you to them on page six of your report. Um, since they're all interlinked, I think they should. it will be normal to take these together. So that's what I propose to do. Um, so could I ask members please to indicate, as normal by showing of hands, if they wish to support this application now. And that is unanimously carried. Thank you, members. Um, right, if you just bear with me a moment, please. Okay, thanks. Right, um, we're now coming on to this next application again. We'll be taking the remaining five applications uh, on block. We'll be obviously voting separately on them, but the times are combined on them. So we go hand straight over to um, Emmy Circuit, I think, who's going to take us through the first one. Good evening. Good evening, Chairman. Thank you. Um, as you said, I will be running through the remaining five applications on the agenda um, just because they are intrinsically linked and it's difficult to separate out um, because there's so much overlap between them. Um, I will start, first of all, with um, an overview of the planning policy context for the applications, um, which stems from the core strategy, which was adopted in 2010 and sets out the strategy for the borough for the period up to 2026. It establishes how much new housing is needed in that plan period and took the approach of concentrating the majority of development in four strategic development locations to allow comprehensive planning of the development and also the delivery of the infrastructure needed to support it. And this approach has proved to be successful in the other SDLs, which are at a more advanced stage than South Wokingham. Um, so the core strategy policies CP 17 and 21 allocate South Wokingham for two and a half thousand new homes, establishing the principle of an urban extension here. And then you have two supplementary planning documents the South Wokingham um, SPD and an infrastructure SPD, which set out the vision for the development in more detail and also specify what infrastructure is needed. And you see here the framework plan for the SPD that shows at a very high level how the development might take place. Um, and 
identifies the South Wokingham distributor road as one of the key pieces of infrastructure that's needed. In terms of where we are with delivery of the SDL at the moment, um, one of the early developments that came forward was actually the development at Montague Park, um, which was approved back in 2012. Um, you have 636 new dwellings there, which is roughly a quarter of the development in the SDL. And the development also secured its proportionate share of infrastructure on site. So you've got the open space that was needed, um, a SANG for play areas, a primary school with an all-weather pitch that um, is suitable for dual use, and a neighbourhood centre, and also the first section of the Southern Distributor Road running south from London Road down to the railway line. And then the next section of the Southern Distributor Road, um, which is often referred to as the Eastern Gateway, was granted planning permission in sort of 2017, 2018, and is under construction at the moment. The applications that are on the agenda this evening cover a large proportion of the remainder of the development in South Wokingham, including the remainder of the Southern Distributor Road, extending from Waterloo Road, where the Eastern Gateway will connect into the existing network, through to Finch Hampstead Road at the sort of Tesco roundabout, and also associated with that, some of the off-site mitigation that's required for the SDL, which is improvements at the roundabout at the junction of Finch Hampstead Road with Molly Miller's Lane. And then we come to the three consortium applications, um, one that covers the major part of the development, which is a hybrid application for um, 1,434 new dwellings um, and a SANG and other infrastructure. Then you have a smaller outline planning application for up to 215 new dwellings in on the far east of the SDL, and another application for a SANG, um, actually north of the railway, adjoining the Buckhurst Meadows SANG at Montague Park. So, and then the final piece of the jigsaw um, is um, the application that I've referred to as phase three in the um, planning reports, um, which is the current application. It's slightly behind the consortium applications, but um, I'm expecting it will be ready to come to committee within the next few months. And between them, um, that would deliver sort of just a few dwellings short of the 250 expected by the core strategy. I think consistent with the requirements of the development plan, um, the developers have been working together to deliver a comprehensive package of development and infrastructure. So you have a comprehensive master plan for the whole of the remainder of the SDL. Also, each application is accompanied by an environmental impact assessment, which considers the cumulative impact of all the developments in the SDL and also development in the wider area um, within the borough and also because it is close to the borough boundary sites in Bracknell as well. Um, and then there's also supporting the applications and infrastructure delivery plan, um, which all the developers have been working on together um, to sort of identify how the infrastructure that's needed will be delivered um, and how each one will make their proportionate contribution to it. And then that infrastructure delivery plan is what informs the conditions and the section 106 is for these applications. The um, Planning reports set out in detail the assessment of the proposals against development plan policies and the SPD guidance. Um, and for the remainder of this presentation, I'm just going to give quite a brief overview of the, those assessments and how the applications fit together. Um, just starting with a few um, photographs of the site, just to give a feeling for it. Um, on the left of this slide, you can see Britain's Farm sort of in the centre of the picture. Um, the Eastern Gateway under construction beyond that, um, and then the development at Montague Park um, slightly to the left. Um, and then, so, um, so that's the end of phase 2B there, and then beyond that the field is phase 2A. Um, and so the area around um, Britain's farm is proposed to be um, an area of open space within the development and then residential parcels around that. The picture on the right is a slightly different angle looking north towards Waterloo Crescent and the sort of elongated section in the centre is where the existing balancing pond is. 
and then this is looking sort of more to the western part of the um, site. So on the top left, you can see Woods Farm um, with the houses and East Hampstead Road to the left. And then you can see East Hampstead Road continuing up to the Star Lane crossing. Um, the picture on the right, you can see home park where the sang is proposed behind the houses in East Hampstead Road and then beyond that Grays Farm which is the land the council's acquired um, with a view to delivering a sports hub although it's not one of the applications before the committee today. Um, bottom right you see a slightly different angle on that and then sort of to the north of it the land where the SDR would run through and the remaining residential parcels and then on the bottom left um, that's an area of ancient woodland and then the land to the left um, between that wood and the Ludgrove access, which would be the western part of the Sang. So that gives a kind of feel for what the site is like at the moment. In terms of what the applications are proposing, um, the, the Southern Distributor Road application, the Western Gateway and the St Anne's Sang applications are seeking full planning permission. The, the Phase 2B, which is the larger application, is a hybrid application seeking full planning permission for the Sang an outline for the remainder for the housing and that is the same for the phase 2a smaller application as well so with those housing elements um, the means of access from the adopted highway is to be approved um, and the principle of development will be established um, but details of appearance landscaping layout and scale will be provided later through reserve matters but based on the principles established by the applications now so you, the maximum number of dwellings is set at 1434 and 215 um, and you have the four parameter plans that you see here which identify where the access from the adopted highway would be um, broadly which areas would be developed and which would remain as open space and also a pattern for building heights with taller buildings along the southern distributor road and around the neighbourhood centre, less dense, lower development on the rural edges and I'll talk about that a bit more detail later on. For the remainder of the um, presentation um, I will structure it around the um, design principles from the um, SPD which relate to the landscape framework, residential areas, character, neighbourhood centres, and finally, and probably the longest section, actually, um, access and movement. But starting with the landscape framework, um, one of the fundamental concepts of the supplementary planning documents is that there should, be, and the core strategy, in fact, is that there should be a continuous network of open space along the Embrook and its tributaries, incorporating existing landscape features and providing for green infrastructure, and particularly SANG, in the vicinity of the residential areas, but that that space should be multifunctional, so well as providing for amenity for residents, um, it will be supporting biodiversity and providing for sustainable drainage as well. And here you see the overview of the whole strategic development location. Um, so you've got the current proposals and also what's been delivered at Montague Park already and what is anticipated in the application for phase three as well. And you'll see there'll be two substantial SANGs with the current application for the St Anne's SANG acting as an extension to Buckhurst Meadows, um, which would provide a single SANG of um, slightly over 20 hectares north of the railway. And um, you can see that the existing Buckhurst Meadows sang actually extends out to the west, sort of um, beyond the school site to join on to the southern distributor road. So for residents from south of the railway, um, you'd come over the railway bridge and then within a couple of hundred metres, you would be at the entrance to the sang there. Um, and then the home park sang um, is proposed to be um, just over 24 and a half hectares. And then the sang within phase three will probably be around eight. So you're looking at probably a 32, 33 hectare sang um, on the southern part of the site. And that's got the Embrook throwing through and incorporating ancient woodland and other existing landscaping um, as anticipated. And also it's providing quite a lot of the um, floods and flood compensation for the Southern Distributor Road and for the housing development as well. And again, that's consistent with that blue-green infrastructure vision set out in the SPD. Other green infrastructure, um, there's a central parkland area um, on the western part of the site, sort of around this area, um, which will provide for quite a lot of the more formal open space within the development. And then you've got green corridors running along the railway, along the southern boundary, and then some going north-south. And I say sort of minimum about 10 metres, mainly high teens, 20 metres in width. 
And I think what you can see from this overview as well, I think we've become very much aware through the pandemic of the importance of access to green space um, and how that is, is very important for people's well-being. And I think here you've got that network of green corridors around the parcels and the larger open spaces. And I think most of the residents of this development would be within a very short distance of getting into that network of open space, probably a couple of hundred metres maximum um, in most cases, and a lot of them will be a bit lot closer than that as well. In terms of meeting the, um, I've just got, an, this is the um, landscape master plan for phase two, so that just shows you a little bit more detail of the layout of those um, green spaces, the footpath network, the network of different habitats, um, providing variety interest and for different um, wildlife um, and how that will be supplementing the existing landscaping that's there on the site and largely retained through the development. But um, in terms of meeting policy requirements for different types of open space, I've already mentioned the two substantial SANGs, um, which would meet the requirements for the whole SDL and actually probably have a bit of surplus as well. Um, the central parkland area is proposed to be the focus for the more formal open space provision, including three of the play areas, um, a multi-use games area, two local areas of play, with a third in phase 2A, and then a larger neighbourhood area of play um, adjoining the neighbourhood centre, and um, a further landscaped area of play within the SANG. Um, so you've got six within phase two, and then you've got an additional four in Montague Park, and then there'll be another couple in the third phase as well. Um, amenity open space will be provided in the green corridors around the site and in smaller pockets of open space within the residential parcels as well. And you have other corridors of semi-natural green space. Um, Groves Farm, I've mentioned, which the council's acquired with a view to providing a sports hub um, and Section 106 contributions from the development would contribute towards the land for that. And then um, the actual delivery of it would be through community infrastructure levy. Civic space would be provided within the neighbourhood centre. Um, so you can see that the proposals would meet the green infrastructure requirements, both in terms of the quantity of open space, but the size and distribution within the phase is also um, appropriate and for the phase and in relation to the SDL as a whole. The next design principle um, related to residential areas and the supplementary planning document envisaged there being sort of four distinct neighbourhoods structured around focal points within the development, um, one being at Montague Park, uh, a smaller one to the west of the SDL around Chapel Green, and then two within the main body of the SDL south of the railway. And that sort of distinct character is starting to emerge from the proposals that are coming forward. Um, you would have the elongated area um, along sort of the railway, between the railway and the Thang, um, on the western part of phase two with the neighbourhood centre as a focus and then the development very much opening out onto those corridors of open space to the north and south of it. And then the on the more easterly part, you know, the more formal open space being a focus for the development and kind of establishing the character of that part of the site. So I think the proposals are starting to form those distinct neighbourhoods that the SPD is looking for. Um, character of the developments is another um, important aspect of it. Um, the earlier slides were based on the illustrative master plan. Um, this is from the design and access statement, and it gives an illustration of how the development might come forward based on the parameters that are established by the application. Um, and within the design and access statement, there are also vignettes showing details of certain bits of the site um, as an example of, of how it could evolve. Um, and what you can see here is the traditional layout of perimeter blocks with buildings fronting the street, giving good definition of public and private space and surveillance of the public realm. Houses with um, active frontages onto the streets, including the Southern Distributor Road. And the approach that's proposed is very much what's happened on the London Road frontage of Montague Park and um, on some of the older developments along the London Road and Finch Hampstead Road as well, where you have a service road. So the houses are slightly set back from the road. And there's a couple of pictures on the bottom right showing how that's um, been developed at Montague Park. You've also got the um, approach to different character areas consistent with the SPD with um, sort of taller, more formal, dense development along the Southern Distributor Road and around the Central Parkland, um, which is a sort of bricky colour on the um, parameter plan extract. 
Um, and then the sort of two storey, lower density, more informal, um, rural transition areas on the um, rural boundaries of the development. And then I think the landscape strategy also helps with that softening of the edge with the sand and green corridors on the edge. Um, prevailing um, building heights are going to be sort of two, two and a half storey, rising to three at intersections of key routes um, where you might want a landmark building to help with legibility and then rising up to four um, in the sort of key locations around the neighbourhood centre, um, which the SPD expects to ident- you know, be, have a very distinct identity and stand out as a focus for community activity and also around the bridge over the railway. Um, The proposals would provide, I mean, this layout is based on a mix in line with the strategic housing market assessment. So a mix of housing types and sizes, as we would expect, also takes into account the separation distance, as we would normally expect, and the council's parking standards. Um, Although it's not strictly character, I'll mention here as well that the proposals would um, include 35% affordable housing and the size and tenure mix proposed will be secured by the Section 106 agreement in line with our policies. So I think it's an outline application. Um, We don't have the detail at this stage, but it has been demonstrated um, that a suitable layout in line with the Council's policy and guidance can be delivered within the proposed parameters. Um, And then condition four of each of the um, housing applications would require a more detailed master plan, design code and landscape design statement. So these ideas would be worked up in more detail before you got to the reserve matters stage, which would establish the detail. Um, And then also there are conditions which set out now the requirements like provision of car parking and cycle parking um, to the council standards that are appropriate at the time. One of the other important principles in the SPD is about um, centres and primary schools. Um, And the policy establishes that there should be two centres within the SDL, neighbourhood centres, um, each with a primary school and provision for shops and community facilities. And the first centre has been delivered, um, it's approaching completion now at Montague Park, um, has a two form entry primary school with provision for extension to three and a parade of shops that will be opening soon. Um, The location that's been identified for the um, second neighbourhood centre is in line with the guidance close to the junction of East Hampstead Road, um, which is really important because it's an accessible location, which is going to be very important to the viability and vitality of the centre. Uh, The site is being delivered for the two form entry primary school and also for a community facility within the neighbourhood centre. And those sites would be um, transferred to the council with delivery of those facilities from community infrastructure levy. And the um, vignette here gives an idea of how they might be developed um, with the school on the right, with staff parking on the site, and then the retail and an element of residential and kind of commercial communal car park um, on the left of the picture. It's very much based on the same model of what's been done really at Montague Park. The other thing to note about this in terms of it being a focus is it's got it's right on the doorstep of the Sang, um, the neighbourhood area of play and the pedestrian cycle access through to the sports hub. So it would very much be a good focus um, for the community activity on the site. Um, and there is a condition that would require a design brief. So sort of more thought and detail on this before any individual applications came forward within the neighbourhood centre. One thing I've also to touch on is that um, has come through from representations is the need for a GP surgery within the development. Um, but we've take, well, we've consulted the NHS Clinical Commissioning Group um, and not seeking a surgery at the moment. So there's no provision proposed within the SDL. But um, the council will be delivering the community facility. So there would be potential to incorporate some sort of outreach facility within that if it was something that was needed at the time. Now, moving on to the final um, design principle, um, which relates to access and movement, and there's quite a lot of detail about this. Um, What the SPD and the policy seeks is a continuous network of streets with a legible hierarchy, including the Southern Distributor Road, and policy sets out three very clear functions for the Southern Distributor Road, um, which is providing access to the development, but also enhancing the street network and allowing for a wider dispersal of traffic and traffic relief in the town centre in particular, bearing in mind it's a conservation area, air quality management area, and that 
the regeneration of the town centre is also a core strategy aim. So the functions for the road are as a corridor for sustainable travel, so a bus route, um, safe, comfortable pedestrian and cycle movement, and that it should have civic quality, so providing access to the development and an attractive place for day-to-day living. And I think one of the great challenges for the team delivering the road has been around the junction with East Hampstead Road. And I think what came apparent from the early modelling that was done, that if you'd had a simple crossroads there, you'd have needed a really large junction. And we're talking something probably comparable with the Copied Beach Junction or something like that, which clearly wouldn't be conducive to placemaking and an attractive place suitable for um, people to kind of carry out day to day life near the school and neighbourhood centre. So the approach that's come up, been come up with is actually to kind of split that traffic between three new traffic light controlled junctions um, with um, MOVA controls on them for efficient operation. So what would happen is that the um, East Hampstead Road um, would become south of the SDR, would effectively become a cul-de-sac, um, stopped up or not stopped up, but the prohibition of driving at the northern end just adjacent to the road. Um, and so for people travelling along the Southern Distributor Road, anyone travelling eastwards would go straight over at that junction. Um, just buses and emergency vehicles would be able to turn left to go north on East Hampstead Road. And any traffic wanted to go south on East Hampstead Road um, would go down a new link road going from the SDR down to former crossroads at the junction with Heathlands Road. Traffic travelling the other direction westwards would either go off south down that link road and would be able to go straight over or northwards onto East Hampstead Road at the um, junction there. For people going north-south on East Hampstead Road, pedestrians and cyclists would be able to continue on the existing route and then through the um, there'd be pedestrian crossings at the traffic light control junction um, there. So, And because the southern part of the road would have become quieter, um, there would there's a condition that would in, secure pedestrian and cycle sort of enhancements on that section of the road. Um, for motor vehicles, um, they would be required to go around a slight diversion um, around that loop. But I think in a car, it's sort of roughly double the distance from Heathlands Road to the level crossing now, which really wouldn't be a significant diversion um, by motor vehicle, especially with the traffic lights operating efficiently. Um, Yeah, so I think so. The if sort of by these these measures, the road fulfills both its strategic function and also provides for the access to the development, which is its primary purpose. Uh, one other thing, just to mention, I think there was a question from the members briefing about how that um, prohibition of driving would be managed. And in fact, I think you can see just from the bottom right here that the li- layout of the road would actually sort of prevent it being abused anyway by the time you've got the embankments and the and this construction of the road and the pedestrian and footpath links going down and the sort of bollards at the end of the cul-de-sac section of East Hampstead Road. The other thing to mention is that there would be a similar arrangement actually on Waterloo Road. Um, again, slightly different situation, but Waterloo Road has quite a narrow rural character at the moment with tree-lined, hedge-lined um, and ditches. And you couldn't upgrade it to add footpaths and cycleways along it without having a significant detrimental impact to the character. So what's proposed is that there will be an alternative route through the development parcels and then um, the existing alignment will provide access to the dwellings along there and again a quieter route for pedestrians and cyclists. Um, the next function for the um, Southern Distributor Road is for sustainable travel, in particular to function as a bus route. Um, it's constructed with a 7.3 metre carriageway, so suitable for bus use. There are proposals for um, five pairs of bus stops along the SDR itself, another one in the um, western part through um, coming through from Waterloo Road, which I was just speaking about, and then some off-site um, bus stop improvements as well. And the strategy that's being looked at and being aimed for is to have a 30 minute um, service running between Bracknell Station and Wokingham Station. So very much on a kind of desire route um, and with 
the service being secured through conditions in the Section 106 agreement. Now, in terms of the um, safe and comfortable pedestrian and cycle movement and civic quality, um, that's something that's already been touched on um, in the discussion about the public right of way um, diversions. What the policy and the supplementary planning document require is that the road should incorporate generous footpath, cycle provision and have street trees lining it on both sides. What's proposed is a three metre wide footpath and cycleway on either side of the road, separated from the carriageway by a three metre wide verge. So integrating street tree planting, um, which is critical for placemaking and achieving quality residential environment, but is also an important factor in making sustainable travel attractive, because I think it's well recognised that having an attractive environment makes people more inclined to walk and cycle. Um, and also incorporated within those verges would be um, part of the sustainable drainage for the road as well. And you'll see a detail on the top left that shows that pedestrians and cyclists would have priority at the junctions with side roads along the route. Also, there would be regular provision for crossing to make that easy. So the three traffic light control junctions would all include pedestrian crossing facilities. Two Toucan crossings are proposed in the vicinity of Tesco's, um, one of which would be at the northern end of Footpath 25 and um, the alignment of the future Greenway. Um, and then I think there are 11 uncontrolled island crossings on the remainder of the SDR and Heath and Link. So they would have an island in the centre and that would be large enough to allow a person with a bicycle or a buggy to wait safely in the centre of the road while crossing as well. So what is proposed is in line with our planning policy and guidance on the pedestrian and cycle provision in the SDL, but it has been criticised, um, as has the Western Gateway application in relation to the new government guidance LTN 120. Um, I think this has been addressed in paragraph 89 of the report on the Southern Distributor Road, um, but I will touch on it again now as well. I think what LTN 120 um, is good practice guidance, um, and it sort of sets out what is the kind of gold standard for cycle um, provision. But it does say that what is appropriate does depend on the circumstances as well. It's very clear cycle networks should be coherent, direct, safe, comfortable and attractive. Cyclists shouldn't be required to share the carriageway where volumes of traffic are high. And the cycle path that is proposed here is off carriageway, shared with pedestrians and segregated from motor traffic by the verge. The guidance acknowledges that shared surface is not generally favoured where flows are high, but I think, as Andrew touched on, are preferable to providing substandard segregated paths. And I think the pictures on the right of this slide here show the paths that have been delivered already in Montague Park and North Wokingham SDLs, which are the same as what is proposed here. Um, and I think things to bear in mind are... This is a suburban area and an east-west route around the town rather than being a route into the town centre. And yes, it probably will be quite a busy route, but when you compare it to a large town or city centre or area around um, a busy railway station or, for example, straight out of a, a, side, a secondary school or something like that, um, it probably will be relatively quiet. A lot of the trips will be um, trips to local facilities, so families going to the primary school, you might have young children on a buggy, a scooter or a cycle accompanied by adults with a buggy, maybe groups of people, you know, walking together, that sort of thing. And I think that will probably be quite a large proportion of the use. Um, and then I think at those times when it's busy in that way, if you had a confident commuting cyclist, they may well prefer to use the carriageway because it will be a 30 mile an hour road. Um, but they would have a choice of, of what they preferred to do. And indeed, there'd be other routes through the site as well, depending on the journey of where you were going and what your preferences were. There'll be routes through the residential parcels down residential streets and also an east-west route through the Sang. Um, so really options available. I think if it was a clean sheet that we had um, and we're starting from scratch now, um, we may well take a different approach. But we are now several years into the design process of this road. And there would be very significant implications of a redesign, which is actually a much trickier thing, I think, than it first appears. You might think, oh, it's simple just to add a bit onto the width of the surface. But actually, you know, you've got to add enough on to have a separate footpath and cycleway and the separation between them. Um, you've got then increased hard surfacing, increased drainage. You've got more of an impact in terms of landscape and habitats. 
And I think you'd be looking probably at something like a 15% increase in land take, the applicant advisors. Um, so then that starts to have knock-on implications for master planning and delays in delivery. And then um, really you're starting to have an impact on the council's five-year housing land supply. And I think the executive resolution that um, sort of embraced LTN 120 did acknowledge that situation where you are quite far into um, the design of a scheme and it may not be possible to go back to square one and review it. I think despite not segregating pedestrians and cyclists, it is still good quality provision and it is consistent with the planning policy and guidance um, and what has been established already in the other SDLs. Um, just to touch on one point from the briefing, members briefing last week as well. Um, I think what's different from the provision currently on London Road um, is you've got cycle provision on both sides of the road, so it's got more capacity. Um, it's all off carriageway rather than being a mixture, and you have got that verge providing the separation as well. And there will be far fewer vehicle crossovers along here compared to what you've got on the more traditional development on London Road. Then I think the other thing that I've shown on this slide is just a few more pictures on the left. Um, again, thinking about the sort of civic quality of the street um, and showing how the Montague Park development um, frontage onto London Road has been handled and how a similar approach might be taken here on the um, SDR. Just one important element of the um, road is the two bridges that will be delivered, the bridge, the road bridge, um, which clearly is a functional structure, but will also be very prominent in views from the existing right of way network and from the proposed SANG. Um, so it's important to consider how its appearance integrates into the landscape and there is a condition that would secure further detail of the design and materials of the, of the bridge to integrate it as well as possible. And then I think Andrew's already talked quite a bit about the boardwalk uh, as a replacement for the current substandard bridge over the Embrook, how that will help deliver the um, Greenway strategy, an important part of the walking and cycling strategy for the SDL. And um, the sort of housing developments will be delivering, secure through condition, the onward um, routes through from that footbridge. So securing that good quality provision up to the railway and beyond. And I think as already been touched on, there will be very occasionally times when the um, bridge is inaccessible due to flooding, which is what you'd expect having an area of open space within the floodplain. Um, but we have got the alternative route over the SDR, which is an improvement to what you've got at the moment. Um, and I think then there will also be some smaller crossings as well within the Sangs as well, because you have got that network of watercourses running through them. In terms of um, pedestrian and cycle improvements, because um, I think providing you, you'll have the new network of routes within the um, development, but they need to then tie into the wider area into destinations that people will want to um, go to. Sorry, I'm just jumping ahead. Actually, I'll just this slide shows the um, the four access points into the from the other up to highway into the development um, and the ability to deliver that clear internet connected network of streets and spaces um, around the traditional perimeter block pattern and with a clear hierarchy of streets. Um, and I think that kind of overlaps with the, the discussion on character. Um, and now moving on to the sort of pedestrian and cycle improvements off site, um, this applicant strategy identifies a few different schemes to improve connections. Um, to the town centre and other destinations um, and they will be secured through conditions and in some cases through the section 106 agreements um, and I'll just mention I won't go through all of them but mention a few key ones um, the routes through the SANG um, will provide a connection through from East Hampstead Road up to the Southern Distributor Road um, so those sort of together will provide for that route which will be an option for people going sort of around the town in that way um, there's a proposal for a pedestrian and cycle route along Waterloo Road and Peacock Lane going towards Bracknell, um, which is, will be an important destination, especially for people in the eastern part of the SDL going to employment and um, leisure and shopping destinations in Bracknell. Um, then sort of thinking about travel south towards Crowthorne, um, there is the Greenway proposal 
and the parts within the SDL will be delivered as part of the housing um, development and then the onward extension towards Crowthorne will be picked up through SIL. Uh, the East Hampstead Road corridor, I've already mentioned that the section south of the SDR will become much quieter and have pedestrian and cycle improvements um, along that section. Um, north from the SDR to the Star Lane crossing, the proposals are to continue the shared footpath cycleway um, around into East Hampstead Road and up to the level crossing. Once you get to the level crossing, um, that's sort of very much in network rail hands, um, their proposals are as part of their re felt and re-signalling project, project to replace the barriers there for automated barriers with better safety features, sensors on and that sort of thing. And there'll probably be an opportunity to look at increasing the width of the, the pedestrian crossings there as well at that time. Um, and then finally, um, the sort of there are proposals to carry out localised improvements along the rest of East Hampstead Road up to Peach Street. The um, final one I'm going to mention is one that's um, caused quite a lot of comment, which is the Finch Hampstead Road corridor. And I've got a slide here that shows that in a little bit more detail. Um, sort of, and I think it's the thing that's kind of important to understand here is this is where it's a bit of a jigsaw with the different applications delivering different parts of the proposals. So as part starting from the south, part of the um, the developers walking and cycling strategy includes sort of use of quiet routes along Luckley Road and Tangley Drive um, to get to Finch Hampstead Road, then provision of a token crossing to get across Finch Hampstead Road just south of where the Western Gateway application um, is. Um, and that's the sort of shown in, in red on the drawing, the location of that. Um, then the turquoise spot is the Western Gateway, um, and that will include a control crossing on the northern arm, um, a control crossing sort of just to the west of the, the roundabout, and then an uncontrolled crossing on the um, western arm close to the roundabout as well. The drawings currently show an uncontrolled crossing on the southern arm as well, but additional information that's been provided about the departure of standards um, that would be required to deliver that um, has been kind of scrutinised by highways. And having considered that in detail, they think that it wouldn't be able to pro be provided safely and should be omitted from the scheme. So one of the um, recommendations in the members update um, that was circulated yesterday was that in addition to condition three, um, that the proposal should be revised to omit that provision from there. Um, and then moving on to what the Southern Distributor Road application um, includes, you have a Toucan crossing um, just south of the Tesco roundabout there, and then uncontrolled crossings on the other arms, and then a couple of other two crossings and uncontrolled crossings um, as you go in along the SDR to the sort of the new roundabout there as well. Um, and then I think the contributions um, from the housing development will also include measures going north from that point up towards the Carnival Pool roundabout, and also to a potential future connection um, to Molly Miller's Lane via Landon Court and Oakey Drive that's being looked at. And then finally, um, turning to sort of off-site highway junction mitigation, um, the applications are supported by extensive transport modelling, looking at the cumulative impact of the SDL and other development. Um, the initial modelling identifies over 20 junctions that needed sort of more detailed assessment. And then coming out from that, there were nine identified that require mitigation. Um, one of those is the Western Gateway application, which is at quite an advanced stage of design already. And uh, just in relation to that, to mention the demolition of two dwellings or two properties associated with that, 81 Finch Hampstead Road, which is a dwelling, and then the family centre at 83 to 85. Um, and alternative premises have been found for that facility already, and it's been have been granted planning permission as well. Um, the other eight schemes are at various stages of um, progress of the detailed design of the schemes, but I think at least preliminary proposals have come forward for all of them. Um, the housing conditions, sorry, the housing applications have a condition that would control the number of occupations that could take place before the full SDR is open. And then all of the applications have conditions requiring details of the phasing, how that's all going to come forward, the timing of housing and the 
these off-site junction works in relation to it. Um, and also um, there are conditions on the housing applications and well, the SDR as well requiring off-site junction works um, to take place to facilitate the development. Um, I think most of those will be delivered through conditions and Section um, 38 agreements with the Highway Authority. Um, a couple of exceptions, I think Heathlands Road and Peacock Lane are secured through Section 106. So that really concludes a sort of very brief overview of the detail that's set out in the um, committee reports in the agenda. I mean, I think I hope it's apparent that together the applications um, will deliver a comprehensively planned development supported by the necessary infrastructure in line with the development plan policy and adopted supplementary planning guidance. Um, and then subject to the detailed design through reserve matters and conditions, um, we'll be able to deliver a high quality sustainable extension to the town of Wokingham that can be supported by the committee. Um, the members' updates been circulated, um, which includes a few points of clarification. Um, I think members have already seen that and I've picked up the most significant ones in the presentation, um, which then takes us on to the recommendations um, for the um, Southern Distributor Road. Um, the recommendation is conditional approval as set out on page 57 of the agenda onwards. For the St Anne Sang application, um, again, recommendation for conditional approval as set out in the agenda um, from page 140 onwards. For the application for phase 2b there was just um, clarification of condition 66 which is the low zero carbon condition um, and apart from those few additional words the recommendation is as from page 280 onwards in the committee report which is to grant conditional approval subject to the prior approval of the Southern Distributor Road and, and SANG and a Section 106 agreement being completed. And then the recommendation is pretty much the same for Phase 2A, same amendment to the low zero carbon um, condition and a conditional approval subject to those other two applications being approved and 106s. Um, the Western Gateway, finally, I've mentioned the, the update to the condition to admit the con uncontrolled crossing on the southern arm of the roundabout, um, and there's that additional clause to cover that, and an additional condition um, to control hours of work. Um, but other than that, the recommendation is as per the um, agenda. So that concludes that um, sort of swift overview of the proposals for South Wokingham. <laughs> Okay, I mean, thank, thank you very much for a, uh, a comprehensive overview of what is indeed a, a quite complex scheme. I want to get, um, for members' benefit, just want to get absolute clarity. Um, with regard to planning application 203535, which is the proposed uh, three-arm roundabout replacing the current mini roundabout at Molly Miller's Lane and Finchampton Road. So the members' update is very clear that you're deleting the uncontrolled crossing that is currently shown to the south of that location, uh, and it's to be replaced by a signalised crossing. That is quite correct, is it? Yes, that's right. Okay. Um, obviously, that isn't featured in what we have in front of us. Uh, so is that going to come forward as part of the persimmon part of the uh, planning application for the SDL site? It's proposed as part of the um, pedestrian cycle um, strategy for the developers, um, but I think there have been some initial discussions that it may well, for sort of um, practical reasons, be delivered by the SDR team as part, at the same time as the Western Gateway application um, that's sort of funded through the housing development. Um, I think, I mean, Jean Melovi may be able to provide a bit more detail on what exactly what the thoughts are there when she um, speaks on the application. Um, but I think certainly we've got those conditions that deal with the phasing of all the development on the applications. And I think we would be able to pick it up through those and ensure that it came forward in a timely way and at appropriate point in the early on in the development. Okay, but um, what I'm concerned about is, is quite straightforward. Um, under the current proposal, uh, without the, the updates that we've just been uh, told of yesterday, that there would be an uncontrolled crossing to the south of the junction. That's now being removed. 
but in terms of what we're being asked to consider tonight, it's not being replaced by anything. So what I'm looking for on behalf of the committee is some assurance as to the deliverability of a controlled crossing at that point, because we don't have that in front of us at the moment, and uh, re simply removing an uncontrolled crossing and not replacing it with anything, I, I, what, what confidence can we have that, that will, the controlled crossing will be forthcoming at an appropriate time? Um, I think complete confidence because it's, it's proposed as part of the pedestrian cycle strategy. Um, it's already been looked at at a preliminary level to see that it can be um, sort of capable of being delivered um, and it would be secured through those conditions um, that require delivery of the pedestrian cycle strategy. Okay, so if if application 203535 was approved tonight, uh, there's no question that there would be an un, there would be a, a signal controlled crossing installed at the same time as the proposed new roundabout was completed. It's not as something that's going to be added as an afterthought after the original roundabout has possibly opened. Um, that could that, that be arranged. I think it's essential. Okay, all right. Thank you very much. Uh, so we now come on to number of speakers that we have on this. And uh, just as we've had a, an overall presentation covering most of the most of the South Wickham SDL, the same happens with the speakers. So uh, just to remind members, we hear normally from the town and parish councillors, and then we hear from any objectors. We then hear from anybody speaking in support of the applications. And finally, we hear on behalf of ward members or adjoining ward members. So uh, we'll move straight on to that. So could I invite uh, Peter Dennis, who's going to be speaking on behalf of Wokingham Town Council on uh, the South Wokingham Distributor Road application. Good evening. Uh, good evening, everybody. Thank you for having me here. Um, I'll just kick off straight away. Um, on the whole, it's a shame that the South of Wokingham is being devastated by this development and further merged blurring of the boundary between Wokingham and Bracknell. However, as the plan for this area has been undertaken for a long time, then commenting on the details of this application is forthcoming. Wokingham Town Council have been commenting on these applications revisions since 16th of December 2019. In every comment, the Town Council have asked and commented about a segregated cycleway lane along the side of the Spline Road. Indeed, this was predating the Government Cycling Infrastructure Design Document, LTN 120. We have continued to receive updates to the plan, but no site has been seen about any segregated cycling lane. The SDR will create a link from New Estates of Wokingham, Montague Park, Key Park, Key Patch Gardens, with a Tesco Superstore. The whole development includes two schools and local shop areas, all of which will generate traffic. It is now time to be brave, take the initiative and demonstrate that Wokingham Borough Council is forward-looking and is taking the declared climate emergency seriously. Building no proper cycling infrastructure will result in people choosing to use motorised vehicles as opposed to forms of sustainable transport. A shared pathway leads to conflict between pedestrians, think dog walkers, old people, young children, and then later conflict with cars who will cry out, why are they not using the shared pavement? We need to encourage our children to cycle, walk to school, not only for the climate, but for their physical and mental health. As such, the design without the facilities fails to meet the local plan of CP6A, sustainable forms of transport, C, improve the existing infrastructure network, E, adverse effects on transport network, F, enhance road safety, and G, highway or environmental problems. Comments have been made about the available space for a segregated lane from observations. There does appear to be space. However, worthy of note is that a cycle lane does not have to follow a road. I am pleased to hear that the speed limit for the road will be 30 miles per hour. Uh, the two new roundabouts at the Tesco end, why not use a Dutch roundabout design that is safe for cyclists, pedestrians and motorists? A question arises about the traffic exiting the roundabout into Tesco's during peak shop shopping times. Will the back with the backlog causing queues on the spine road? As an aside, cycling is on the increase, not only sporting, but for leisure. With the advent of e-bikes and e-scooters, this will increase. Let's make it easier for our community to adopt sustainable transport, at least for the shorter journeys. Finally, the removal of several TPNO trees, T4, T5, T7 and T36, is disappointing. Um, just moving on slightly to the SANG, because um, we were asked to put everything together. Um, the site for the proposed SANG is inappropriate. It is not near the development. Indeed, it means crossing a wary line. 
though a new bridge is in place, traversing through an existing SANG which has been provisioned for Montague Park. The pro proposed SANG is in an area that will not be built upon due to its location. The proposed site is in an area where there is no, there is notable wildlife creatures. For example, slow worms are, are as evidenced by the ecological survey undertaken by another development near St Anne's Manor. That is 2035. As a note, uh, could, I, could I ask you to draw to conclusion because yeah, you've had your final time. Sentence, you. Final sentence. As a note, this location is not identified as a location mm -hmm. in the South Wokingham SDL in the existing local pound. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, can I now invite uh, Adrian Mather, who I think is here in person. Good evening, Adrian. Uh, again, speaking on behalf of Wokingham Town Council. Yes, thank you very much, Chair. I'd like to say thank you to the Chair for trying to clarify what um, kind of crossings are actually going to be in this application or not. Um, the application, as we see it today, loses some controlled crossings. Uh, these are on busy, uh, you know, roads and I regard this as very very dangerous but let me go into my my speech if you like um, so the working in town planning committee did meet to discuss this application uh, we came to a consensus and we rejected this application in the in the committee's view this this scheme does not comply with the minimum standards requirements and guidelines of working in borough councils planning policies and core strategy specifically cp1 cp2 and cp3 uh, with regards to the uh, removed uh, pedestrian controlled crossing points, uh, we regard this as being against central government and NHS recommendations to, to walk more. Uh, it's against actually Woking Borough guidance to walk more. And uh, in, in our view, this could uh, significantly increase in the, the risk of uh, KSIs or killed or seriously injured pedestrians or cyclists on these roads. Um, I'd like to move on now to the elephant in the room. Um, we have a new road, a big new road going towards Tesco's, which is a very small roundabout. Um, there will be significantly more traffic piling into this roundabout. Um, this scheme uh, completely omits and completely fails to address, in, in, in our view, one of the main points, which is the two Victorian railway bridges directly to the north and directly to the south of the Tesco roundabout. Um, these bridges were designed when a horse and cart were regarded as heavy goods vehicles. Modern traffic is completely different. These bridges are too low, too narrow, do not comply with modern minimum standards for pedestrians and cyclists. These bridges are an accident waiting to happen. Um, if anyone doubts these bridges and uh, passing underneath them is unsafe, I suggest you cycle through one of these bridges when a HGV is using it. It is a, a truly terrifying experience. We have been talking tonight about pathways being four metres, pathways being three metres. <clears throat> um, the Southerly Bridge has one pathway, which is one and a bit metres. Uh, the Northerly one has pathways, I believe, both sides, which is one point something metres each side. Uh, both these bridges are very dangerous. Um, my ask for you today, councillors, is that if any councillor is considering accepting this part of the application, and this is 203.535, to really consider whether the removal of pedestrian crossings and the, um, the nature of these very, very old bridges, which are not designed for modern uh, traffic, um, I want councillors to consider whether this application really is addressing what this town needs and specifically the risk of uh, pedestrian and cyclists uh, getting injured or dying. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, we now come on to the category of objectors and uh, we have uh, three people. We have Andy Bowker speaking as a resident, Adrian Betteridge speaking on behalf of Watch and Paul Evans speaking as a resident again. Um, I think you understand, hopefully you understand that you have a collective four minutes between you. 
and I assume you've agreed in some way how you're going to share your time uh, because it's not very helpful if one of you takes three and a half minutes. So um, straight over, I've got you, um, I've got Andy Bowker down first, uh, then we'll go to Adrian Betteridge, and then I've got Paul Evans joining us virtually. Is that correct? Yes. Thank you very much. So Andy Bowker. Okay, firstly, I would like to remind the planning committee that you are elected to represent residents, not officers. As such, you should have a high regard for the comments made by your electorate, which are predominantly against this proposal. It is not what the people want or need for their community. If a larger roundabout is to be built at this location, there are better options. The best option places a larger roundabout and new bridge on the site of Woking Motors, Eden Motors. Indeed, a sale of the garage for this purpose was agreed in 2013. And according to the design and access statement, this option was considered but dismissed. A Freedom of Information to Network Rail has provided evidence the replacement bridge was not fully investigated and should be con still considered as a better option to the one put forward to you today. Without a wider bridge, the traffic issues highlighted by officers as a reason for this project will not be achieved. In April 2019, officers moved to a revised design which included maintaining the pedestrian crossing on the south side of Finchampstead Road as well as adequate approach sight lines. Both requirements of the safety audit. This design was the pre preferred option for over 18 months However, one month prior to submitting the plans, officers withdrew the need for both. This rushed approach has clearly compromised safety in order to avoid paying compensation required to purchase the land for the preferred option. And can I just say the departure from standard does not relate to the pedestrian crossing. It relates directly to the approach sight lines, which will not be in place. It is evident that officers have little regard for well thought safe design. Maybe that is because most are contractors who do not live in the area and are quite prepared to try and push through a flawed project to move on. But that is why you, the committee, exist to, play, to put place and checks and balances on poor design. It is clear that there are better and more cost effective long term alternatives, which the committee has a legal duty to consider. The current design is not even what the officers want, which is why they have a list of conditions. Therefore, the committee should not approve this scheme, but be recommended for public inquiry. I'm sure that no member of the committee wants to approve a scheme that will not fulfil its purpose and knowingly compromise safety. Thank you. OK, thank you very much. And now Adrian Betteridge. Thank you. I'd, I'd like to address the committee specifically on the Western Gateway roundabout and its suitability for walking and cycling. On average in the UK, each week, 11 pedestrians and cyclists are killed or seriously injured. One in four of the cyclists are affected while circulating around a roundabout where they're invariably struck by a faster moving car. The National Planning Policy Framework requires applications for development to give first priority to pedestrian and cycle movements. In contrast, this proposal takes a reasonably safe junction and replaces it with one designed to maximise the flow of vehicles at the expense of vulnerable road users whose needs are scarcely considered. The application claims that the design is adequate, despite there being no provision for safe cycling on two of the three sides of the roundabout and the removal of the existing pedestrian crossing, uh, which is replaced with a choice of either uncontrolled crossings, a long diversion, or some as yet to be defined future alternative crossing further down the road in a location which we don't know. These changes have been made since the, the previous public consultation in the full knowledge that children walk and cycle through this roundabout to at least four separate schools, uh, the design comprehensively fails the latest government guidelines, which are a minimum standard, not a gold standard, would not be considered reasonably adequate by any modern measure, and in one case go against the advice of the independent safety advisor. The government expects half of all local journeys to be walked or cycled by 2030 for the sake of the climate, air quality, health and congestion. This scheme will have the opposite effect. In the near future, active travel England will not allow us to implement schemes like this. You have a choice today to insist on better for us now. The design can be adapted for walking and cycling if the will is there, and I strongly recommend you make the approval conditional on proposals to achieve this. Thank you. Thank you very much. And uh, finally, Paul, Everton, Paul, sorry, Paul Evans, who is joining us remotely, hopefully. If I can just share a, a picture. If I may, just want to highlight I'm resident in, from number 96 on the eastern side of Finchampton Road and wish to object to the roundabout as we've not been consulted in the design. The constitutions, as we see, part of our drive highlighted in the red. We've got the pavement uh, for the central reservation plus the obstructions of a sign, etc. that's going to prevent us cross 
the road to the front as the drive seems to have been removed completely from the design. Um, so no, cons no consultation for us, creating additional hazard for us uh, turning into and out of our drives. At least we need a, a, a key clear section putting into there to help us. What's also been neglected is any noise um, surveys. Uh, they've undertaken them for number 87 and proposed noise reduction measures, but no such consideration has been placed for the houses on the eastern side as well. Again, increased traffic, volume and speed will increase noise. So therefore, we also need some noise, uh, potentially some noise reduction measures in place. Um, Hopefully that, that diagram is uh, just clear of that the hazards involved in crossing the road there. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, so uh, we now have some objectors speaking on behalf of the distributor road application. And uh, first, if I could invite uh, Alex Cran, resident, uh, who will be followed by Fitzroy Morrissey. And again, you have three minutes to share between you. I think I understand you're both joining us virtually. So firstly, uh, Mr. Cran, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for letting me speak. Um, I just want to object to the uh, design of the, the South Distributor Road. Um, this is a this road is a sort of once in a lifetime opportunity to get things right. Um, and I don't think the council or the designers are getting it right. Um, you know, opportunities like this don't come along very often. What I'm particularly objecting to is the uh, shared use footway. Um, this is not suitable for um, cyclists or pedestrians particularly. Um, it puts both into conflict with each other um, and is obviously something that once it's implemented will be very difficult to change. Um, you know, I think that if we don't get this right now, it's it's really going to cause a lot of problems going forward. The council has set uh, targets for reducing pollution, addressing the climate emergency, and a lot of that relies on getting people walking and cycling more um, from a very low level. And with the plans as they are, this is really not going to be uh, you know suitable in any way. The, it has the, the road has the potential to be an excellent use, an excellent route for cyclists and pedestrians and, and lots of people to access the town centre from the south and west of the borough. Um, so in, in essence, it's a very, very good uh, route and it just needs to be got right in the first place because if it isn't done right this time, it's not going it, to, it's, it's very unlikely to be changed. Um, and that's all I've got to say. Thank you. Okay, uh, thank you, Mr. Cran. Now, uh, Fitzroy Morrissey. Hello. Uh, my common concern is the flood risks associated with the South Distributor Road development. Uh, I live around 30 yards from Luckley Brook, upstream of the proposed development. In January and February of this year, our property suffered a severe groundwater flood, which the Environmental Agency believed was connected to the very high levels of Luckley Brook at the time. This winter, there was also serious flooding in the wood beside Luckley Brook, and considerable water collected beneath the railway bridge at the end of Luckley Road and on the road leading to Ludgrove School Drive, where many local residents come to walk. There's also a history of flooding affecting properties on nearby Luckley Wood. These recent incidents have been reported to the Council Flooding Team and the Environmental Agency, but are not taken into account in the recently published flood risk assessment report for this development. I therefore appreciate clarification of what measures will be taken to ensure that the development, and particularly the proposed diversion and culverting, of Luckley Brook doesn't create the risk of more regular and even more serious flooding in the area in the future and would ask councillors to commit to ensuring that this risk is closely monitored both during and after the development process before granting permission. Thank you very much. Thank you Mr Morrissey. Um, so we now come on to those who are registered as supporters and they'll be followed by the ward members. Um, so firstly we have uh, Jean Malovi on behalf of WBC who will be speaking in support of the uh, new junction at Molly Miller's Lane and Fidget Road and the South Wokingham Distributor Road and because it's the combination of those two you have seven minutes uh, the same as previous people had but shared differently and you'll be joining us virtually. That will be followed by uh, representatives of, uh, sorry, there'll be people from Nexus Planning, Roger Tustain, 
It'll be Craig Rawlinson from Pegasus Transport and Chris Patmore from WSP, who will share nine minutes between them. First one uh, we'll be talking about is the SANG, then the King's Acre application, and finally the Keir Miller Homes application. So we'll start off with uh, Jean Malovi. Okay, good evening all. My name is Jean Malovi. I'm here to speak in support of the two road applications on behalf of Walking and Borough Council, who is the applicant. And the applications are reference 203535 Western Gateway and 192928 South Walkingham Distributor Road. In development of both schemes, we have undertaken extensive public consultation, first in 2014 with the Route Development Study and subsequently through the South Walkingham Community Forums. We also held staffed public exhibitions prior to the submission of each of the applications. We have also met with some local community groups. The SWDR team has worked closely with the South Walkingham SDL developers to ensure that the designs for both the road and housing developments are comprehensively planned and coordinated. Wherever possible, the road scheme has allowed for the SDL future requirements such as utility provision, which is to be made in the footways, and also the provision of accesses leading into the housing development. I know Amy has, mentioned, has talked about LTN 120 briefly, but I think I'll talk about it a bit more. Both road schemes were significantly progressed by the time LTN 120 guidance was published and adopted by WBC. As mentioned by Emmy, we have, however, assessed the designs in light of the new guidance and believe that the scheme designs are a good fit with gear change and the placemaking guidance for South Walkingham. LTN 120 recommends segregation of cyclists on urban streets. Due to the constrained highway corridor on Finch Hampstead Road, it would not be possible to provide segregation within the existing highway boundary. For the SWDR, we have undertaken an assessment to establish the impact of introducing segregation, segregation facilities retrospectively. This would increase the scheme footprint by approximately 15%, further compromise the floodplain, and would also require a wider road bridge. The resultant redesign would also have both cost and time implications. I will now speak to each application in turn. I will start with the, spine, uh, the South Walkingham Distributor Road application. The application covers the construction of the final section of the SWDR. This new section of road is a single carriageway and will link Finch Hampstead Road to, to Waterloo Road. A link will also be provided to link, to, to link the new roads to Heathlands Road. The road will run through the South Walkingham SDL as shown in the plans that Emmy shared earlier. The new road is approximately 2.7 kilometres long, with shared, uh, shared pedestrian and cycle facilities on both sides of the road. A new road bridge and a footbridge over the Embrook, as well as associated landscaping, street lighting and drainage. A key constraint to this site is the fact that the site is partially located in a floodplain and intersects two watercourses. In liaison with the SDL applicants, a flood mitigation solution comprising of drainage basins is to be provided within the, within the prom proposed consortium's home park sang. I'm pleased to report that as a result, there is betterment to the flood resilience on Finch Hampstead Road in the area around the existing Tesco roundabout. The flood mitigation solution does not, operate, uh, does not affect the operation of the sang. The Environment Agency, Natural England and the Council's Flood Risk Manager are all satisfied with the proposals. The scheme has also been subjected to an environmental impact assessment and it does have some environmental impact which the team is working to mitigate through a series of enhancements so as to offset these impacts. The environmental impact assessment also shows that the scheme provides improvements to air quality, noise environment, habitat creation and management as well as providing opportunities for active travel. The new road alignment intersects the public footpath network, as has been highlighted by Andrew in his presentation earlier. The application for the road was initially submitted in November 2019, and I'm pleased to advise that during the determination period, we have taken on board some of the comments arising, resulting in revisions to the proposal which was initially submitted, and this was to ensure that we achieve a scheme that meets user needs as much as possible. I shall now go on to talk about the next scheme, which is the Western Gateway Scheme. The Western Gateway Scheme is a proposed highway improvement of the existing Finch Hampstead Road Molly Millers Lane Junction. 
The proposed works comprise of the replacement of the existing mini roundabout with a larger 3M roundabout and associated landscaping. The scheme would necessitate the demolition of properties 81 and 8385 Finch Hampstead Road. A key constraint to this site is the fact that Finch Hampstead Road is a key route in and out of Walkingham. As such, the scheme has been developed in an online, offline location whereby the construction of the roundabout shall be away from the existing highway on the land that is currently occupied by the properties to be demolished. This will minimise disruption to, pub, to the public during construction. The scheme provides the necessary improvements to increase capacity at this junction in support of the SWDR and the South Walking MSDL. The scheme will also improve facilities for pedestrians and cyclists, in particular, the location where pedestrians have been observed crossing informally in Finch Hampstead Road will now have a formal signal controlled crossing installed. The scheme has been through a number of iterations with the scheme layout finalised in part in mid-2019 and further modifications made in 20, October 2020 prior to submission for planning. We have also taken into consideration comments received during the determination period and as, as mentioned by Amy, there is, there's been a further change to the proposal submitted whereby the uncontrolled crossing on the southern arm of Finch Hampstead Road is to be removed from the scheme. In its place, a controlled crossing shall be provided at a location close to Tangley Drive, in line with the SDL developers' proposals put forward as part of their walking and cycling strategy. And I know one of the members did question what certainty they, or reassurance they do have that this crossing will be provided. I believe it will be secured as part of con Condition 3 for the application 203535. A number of trees would need to be removed and whilst it's proposed to plant trees as part of this scheme, it is acknowledged that perhaps there isn't sufficient space for us to re replace all the trees that would be taken out. And it is proposed that mitigator replanting will be provided as part of the SWDR proposals. This approach has been agreed with the WBC landscape and ecology officers and will also be secured by condition. So in conclusion for both schemes, should consent be granted here tonight, our detailed design process for both schemes will be completed by the end of this year. As part of this process, construction programmes will also be developed in line with the SDO delivery programme. Can I ask Thank you to you come to conclusion now, please? Thank you all for your time. I finished. Thank you. Right, um, now we come on to uh, uh, representatives of Nexus, Pegasus Transport and WSP. Um, you're, I think all three of you, I understand, are joining us virtually. And again, I assume you've agreed between you how you will use your allocated nine minutes. So who's going first? Is it Roger? It, yes, Chair. Thank okay. you. Roger, please, go, please go yeah. ahead. Thank you. Um, well, good evening. Um, my name is Roger Tustain. I'm a Director of Planning at Nexus Planning, and I'm representing Keir Ventures, Miller Homes and King Acre Estates. And I'm speaking tonight in support of the full application for the St Anne Sang, um, the hybrid application for up to 1,434 dwellings known as uh, Phase 2B and the outline application for Phase 2A, which comprises 215 dwellings. These applications, together with the South Wokingham uh, Distributor Road and the Western Gateway applications, comprise the majority elements of the Council's core strategy allocation within policy CP21, which allocated approximately 2,500 dwellings on land to the south of Wokingham. The first phase of this, as identified earlier, of um, policy CP21, accommodated 636 dwellings to the north of the railway line, which is known as Montague Park, and is now substantially complete. The applications to consideration tonight, together with Montague Park, comprise up to 2,285 dwellings. The final phase of the South Wokingham development location in the control of the Simon Homes is likely to be considered by the planning committee in the next few months. That will comprise just less than 200 dwellings. The overall site, therefore, will deliver a quantum development just marginally below the core strategy policy target. In summary, the proposals tonight in front of you comprise up to 1,649 new dwellings, of which 35% will be affordable. That's 577 new affordable homes. A new local centre comprising local shops and land for a community facility. A new two-form entry primary school. 
two SANGs, one integrated as an extension to the Montague Park SANG, which when implemented will provide a major area for informal recreation to the southeast of the town. The other, to the south of the SDL, will integrate with the proposed new local centre and the council's land at Grace Farm, potentially providing a major town-wide resource for both formal and informal recreation. A network of on-site open space comprising immediately open spaces, strategic landscaping, new parks and gardens, allotments, natural green space and play areas, sustainable urban drainage providing a network of swales and on-site balancing ponds designed collaboratively with the South Wokeham Distributor Road team to ensure a fully integrated approach. My colleague later will explain a little bit more about this. An on and off-site cycle and pedestrian strategy and significant highway junction improvement proposals to assist in mitigating traffic impact and a comprehensive public transport strategy servicing the entire site via routing from Bratnell Station through to Wokingham Station. It's important to note that the residential elements of the proposals are in outline. The design and access statement and illustrative plans submitted to support the application demonstrate how the development could come forward consistent with the design principles set out in adopted policy and further amplified in your adopted South Wokingham supplementary planning document. However, more detail on phasing, housing mix within the phases and specific character areas within the site will need to be established through the discharge of conditions and subsequent reserve matter applications. That process will ensure that there is a coherent approach to what will be a multi-phase development delivered over a period of up to 10 years. Initial site capacity testing through the application process has demonstrated that all dwellings can achieve the national space standards and importantly, the council's adopted parking standards the latter to be demonstrated formally through condition and reserve matter discharge. The evolution of these applications has been complicated. The site has a number of constraints and both the Council's South Wokingham Distributor Road team and the Consortium's team have had to work in concert with the Council's planning team and the statutory consultees in order to evolve a fully integrated and technically robust set of proposals which effectively form the final part of the adopted core strategy jigsaw. The consortium is now keen to progress with the delivery of this well-established allocation through the building of affordable and market homes for the area. I'm now going to pass over to Craig Rawlinson, the consortium's transport advisor, to provide a brief overview. But finally, I would like to thank the council officers involved in this project who have worked with our team in a proactive way over the past few years and what has been a complicated process. Craig. Good evening. My name is Craig Rawlinson. I speak about the plan application set out with Mr. Tustain, 190914, 191068, and 190900. I'll lead on addressing the transportation aspects of the applicant's project. Firstly, I would like to say that we've collaborated significantly with the team delivering the distributor road to make sure things are consistent. Secondly, that we've received a lot of assistance from your highway officers in addressing the relevant issues. I consider the site as a good site in transportation terms for residential development. It provides complementary facilities, including a local centre and primary school, and they will be designed for high permeability. This will help minimise the need to travel off site. The town centre is within walking and cycling distance. A comprehensive set of walking and cycling improvements is agreed on the corridors that link the site to the town. These will be secured through a combination of planning conditions and obligations. For those that wish to travel further afield, a new bus service is proposed further to dialogue with a local operator. It will run through the site and between Wokenham Railway Station and Bracknell Bus Station at a 30 minute frequency. This likely far exceeds what was originally envisaged when the site was identified for allocation. The scheme will bring forward new bus stops on the site and improve bus stops off site. The new distributor road will help mitigate the traffic impacts associated with the development. Testing work has been carried out alongside the Council's SDR team, which has confirmed that there will still be some junctions in the town that will need to be improved. So scheme designs have been identified working with your highway officers. The applicants are committed to encouraging sustainable travel. As well as walking, cycling and bus measures, they will bring forward electric charging facilities in the car club. Also funding so that the council can apply its My Journey travel planning initiatives for the benefit of future site occupants. 
In conclusion, I commend the development proposal to the planning committee. I will now hand you over to Mr Chris Patmore, who leads on drainage issues. Thank you. Thank you, Craig. Um, I'm Chris Patmore from WSP, um, looking at the consortium's uh, flood risk and drainage uh, uh, response and details. And uh, as um, mentioned by Jean earlier, we've worked um, very um, collaboratively with not only uh, working in borough council's drainage teams, but also their highways teams, their landscaping, ecology, master planning and engineering teams to ensure that the drainage and the flood risk response is coordinated through all of the applications such that um, none of the works uh, compromise each other and that they actually complement each other. And within the SDL site, we're looking at a number of watercourses. We have the M Brook uh, as the main watercourse. We have a tributary of the brook which flows from east to west alongside the SWDR. And we have two sizable Thames water sewers which enter the site from the north um, and discharge to the existing attenuation basin located uh, at East Hampstead Road. The uh, tributary of the book is, uh, brook is to be enhanced um, and diverted alongside the SWDR um, to work to help reduce flooding, provide a, a more useful linked green corridor. Um, and the development will sit alongside this, but not require any further amendments um, at any later stage. Um, the Embrook itself is not impacted by the proposed um, SDL developments uh, on the consortium side. The Thames Water sewers uh, will need to continue to discharge to the Embrook, but their original design would not have catered for climate change, which we are now incorporating into the design. So the replacement um, scheme of attenuation which allows for the road, the existing situation, the existing brooks um, and the new development is located in the Sang area as, as uh, explained earlier but is also part of a widespread ec ecological and landscaping scheme. Extensive flood modelling has been done as, as mentioned by Jean earlier um, this has been agreed with the Environment Agency. It's been agreed with Woking and Borough Council as in their role as lead local flood authority. And this takes into account, as, uh, as I said before, of all of the schemes. It also employs the best practice sustainable drainage design in that we are incorporating the sort of four pillars of, of sustainable drainage. And in terms of flows discharging from the developed areas, these are going to be limited to the undeveloped greenfield situation in such a way that it improves water quality, but also holds back a lot more water. The Could overall, I ask you to draw to a close now? You've had your time. Certainly. Um, overall, we are reducing the discharge to the Embrook uh, downstream of the combined development. Thank you very much. Okay, uh, thank you. And now, finally, we come on to ward members. Uh, firstly, uh, Mar Maria G, who's ward, ward member for Westcott, who is going to be joining us uh, virtually, I think. Good evening, Maria. Oh, good evening. Um, I'll be speaking on two items tonight. Um, item 77, which is the South West Distribution Road, and item 78, I think, which is the SANG. So I'll tell you when I switch. Um, so with the South Western Dis South Working Distribution Road, I'm going to focus on pedestrians, um, which includes those using mobility aids, such as mobility scooters and wheelchairs, and others, I have no doubt, and has already happened, will put the case very well from the perspective of cyclists. The Council has a duty under the Road Traffic Act to manage the road network for the expeditious and safe movement of pedestrians. The needs of vulnerable pedestrians must always be considered in new road schemes. LTN 120 design principles achieve this partly by treating cyclists as vehicles and not as pedestrians. The average walking pace is three to four miles an hour. The average beginner road cyclist moves at around 10 to 12 miles an hour and those with more experience can travel at 20 miles per hour. If you're a pedestrian, you'll be overtaken by cyclists quite often on a well-used route which the SWDR is designed to be and should be for access to Wokingham Town Centre and other facilities. If you have children on foot or travelling slowly on cycles, wobbling a bit, then adult cyclists will pass you at speed. 
If you're pushing or using a wheelchair, you'll need more room. If you're hard of hearing, you'll be caught unawares when cyclists come past you. If you are walking to school or town in a group, uh, as Emmy mentioned earlier, then the chances are you'll be using the whole footway. The other way of looking at this is that cyclists will constantly come across pedestrians, young and old, hard of hearing, wheelchair users, kiddies wobbling on cycles when they commute to work. These situations have the potential to cause conflict between cyclists and pedestrians. Cyclists moving onto the roadway will conflict with motorists for exactly the same reasons. Cyclists are smaller, slower and more vulnerable than the cars and lorries. Cyclists and pedestrians are given much less space than motorists in this proposal. That does not give a good message. If we are to encourage cycling and walking, then the space given over to non-motorised provision must be the same as that for motorised vehicles. There is space in this proposal to separate pedestrians and cyclists. See DAS page 15. Please think again and send this back for redesign to put non-motorised users of the roadway or the footway on an equal footing with motorists. If we don't do it now, then we'll have to do it later at greater expense. And I ask the committee to refuse that application, this application. Um, I'll move on to item 78 now, which is about the SANG. The provision of SANGs is to alleviate the pressure on the Thames Basin Heath SPA by encouraging new residents in local developments to stay local. In order to achieve this, the SANG should be attractive and accessible. This SANG is not near the new development and is bordered by a railway and a major road. This is hardly the serene space that most of us would envisage when going for a walk. It is noticeable in Dinton Pastures, for example, that the areas of the park closest to the motorway are the least visited. Dinton Pastures has the attraction of being joined up with more open countryside towards the A4. The proposed site in this application, I fear that the same will happen here, that um, people will avoid um, the areas nearer to the, the noise. And the site does not join up easily with other open countryside, but with another sang. Then there's proximity to the new developments. I think this is very noticeable on the, the um, pictures put up by Emmy earlier. It's separated by a railway line, so the mitigation of journeys to sensitive, area, se sensitive spaces will be defeated. The residents using this sang will be from Montague Park, which is great, but it doesn't add to the facilities for the new development. Residents in the new development can only access the SANG from Buckhurst Meadows, and I think that's something I would like to draw to the attention of the committee. And the parking for the SANG, for the new SANG, is also from the Buckhurst Meadow car park, and that car park is already crowded at weekends and sometimes during the day. On both counts, this land should not be converted to a SANG. It's in the wrong place, both for enjoyment and use, and I urge the committee to reject the proposal. Thank you. Thank you very much. And now, finally, we come on to Sarah Kerr, uh, who's uh, speaking for four minutes. Sarah, good evening. Thank you very much, Mr Chairman. And I'm speaking against uh, the Western Gateway to 03535. I'd like to remind you that Core Policy 10 states, and I quote, improvements to the railway bridges on the A321 Finch Hampstead Road, Wokingham, are integral to the core strategy. This is also reiterated in Core Policy 21. If you approve these applications tonight, you are actually going against the Council's own core strategy. Improving the railway bridge isn't just about space for high-sided vehicles, of which there will be more with all the new housing. In the report, the officer notes states that it is acknowledged that existing footway provision under the railway bridge has a substandard width and is limited to the eastern side of the road only. Whilst this would benefit from improvement, it falls outside the scope of the current application. This should be within the scope of the application, but highways have chosen not to take this option. According to Network Rail, the Council's highways team had just two meetings with Network Rail about the bridge. Network Rail said, and I quote, the meeting in London, March 2019, was just an initial kickoff meeting to understand the project, risks, programme of work, and hence how we could support from an asset protection perspective. Unfortunately, we couldn't establish that as the Council didn't have a clear plan of the work at that point, so this project was not progressed further. I believe this is a good, uh, good point to remind the Planning Committee of two things. You're here tonight to represent the public, not the Council's Highways Department, and every single one of you here voted in favour of declaring a climate emergency and the associated actions with that. So what we've been left with is a bigger roundabout, which will lead to high speeds of vehicles, with no improvement to walking and cycling infrastructure, and thus making this junction more dangerous. And without putting active travel at the top of the transport hierarchy, this is a failure on our climate emergency commitments. Do not be fooled by the claims that this has improved active travel, and you've already heard other speakers explain why, so I won't repeat. 
If this junction is genuinely about alleviating traffic, then there is only one real solution. Design a scheme that makes active travel measures safer and more appealing to reduce the number of vehicles on the road network in the first place. I just want to touch on the crossings. Um, the addition of a new pedestrian crossing on the northern arm of the junction satisfies current desire lines. The amount of times I've seen pedestrians play chicken with the road there, I've lost count. The southern one, um, Councillor Weeks did pick up on the point I was going to make. It's not actually in one of the conditions that you're voting on tonight, this controlled crossing. So I don't get why they've not put it in. They're talking about maybe coordinating it with it, but it has to be in the conditions if it's going to go in. I have absolutely no faith until it's in black and white. The other point, point about this is the omission of the uncontrolled crossing from the southern arm of the roundabout. Um, they might take away the crossing, but there's still going to be a splitter island there. And if you look at your plans on page 51 in your pack, you'll see there that um, with that splitter island, one of the reasons why there was issues with the safety audit was because of the sight lines. If they do propose putting that crossing further towards Tangley Drive, you are going to have people that are going to try and cross at that splitter island, whether it is a crossing or not. And if you can see, they were originally until a month before they put the plans in, going to be taking some of the land from 89. They're now not doing that, and you have severe sightline issues, and they're not addressing that. So I don't believe that's actually been covered tonight. Um, just a couple of other points. and um, We already heard from um, another resident on Finch Hampstead Road. Um, I know he um, crackled up a little bit. If you look on your plans again on 51, if you look where number 96 is and number 100 is, there is supposed to be a shared driveway there. It is not on the plans. Um, how on earth they are supposed to turn northbound right out of their drive with Splitter Island there, I have no idea. I and the residents have asked highways this repeatedly and they've never responded. So make of that what you will. Maybe you'll get better luck. Um, this site is also just 600 metres south of a current AQMA. Pollution levels have been lower recently due to the town centre regeneration with the road shut and reduced traffic due to COVID. This will rise again. The design actually shifts a known problem and obviously there will be increased traffic. So we are actually going to get an increase in air quality, in poor air quality. And remember, it kills people. This is a route used by children. Children go to school and um, to several schools. And I've had so many residents get in touch with me, really worried for the safety of their children, not only from the bad design of this, but also the air pollution. I'll make my one. I just heard the buzzer. So one final thing to say. If you meant it when you voted for a climate emergency, then you must turn this application down and tell them to resubmit a scheme that tackles the bridge and gives people the choice of how they travel. Thank you very much. Thank you. So that, that concludes all the registered speakers. So um, now we're going to hear more from the members. Uh, before we do so, uh, I've made some notes as we've gone through what I hope are some of the key points and would uh, invite... Uh, officers to give us some answers to some of these. Um, I think just before I start, it's just worth reminding people that uh, back in 2010, this council developed a core strategy to deliver 13,000 houses by 2026 due to pressure from various governments to so do. Um, we've delivered largely the Shinfield Three Mile Cross uh, uh, strategic development location, uh, the Arborfield strategic development location, which is in fact, despite its name, located exclusively in Barkham and, and, and my ward, Finchamstead South, that is underway. Uh, the North Wokingham development, as we've seen, is very prominent and is well underway. And this, this particular application has come forward very much later than expected uh, for a, vari a significant variety of, of reasons. But uh, so some people are a little surprised to see this application coming forward. Uh, it's 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 not a surprise. It's the fourth part of the SDLs, and I think uh, most residents agree that the solution for us building houses is to build suitable size developments to get appropriate infrastructure and development to help those developments to be uh, not by any means exclusively, but to be increasingly self-supporting. So just as a bit of a background as to why we're we're considering this application so long after we've already approved the other SDLs. Um, I think things I'd like the officers to comment on um, are the issues relating to the railway bridges uh, and why they are mentioned in the core strategy but are not incorporated uh, in what's before us today. Uh, I need, I think we would all like to get some absolute clarity on the safety safety audits related to what is proposed tonight, uh, not least the sight lines and speeds. Um, we need to get some reassurance that the uh, maximising the flow of vehicles 
uh, it was mentioned, uh, the implication being that it was disadvantaging pedestrians and cyclists. I'd like a little bit more understanding of how what is proposed tonight is uh, presumably attempting to address or to avoid disadvantaging pedestrians and cyclists. And um, also there was a reference to the fact that we should be applying future standards now. Um, I'd just be interested if we could initially, with members' forbearance, if we could just hear collectively from whichever appropriate officers feel able to answer those points. So, uh, Judy. Hi, I'm just going to Good evening. Good evening. Uh, I was just going to mention the, uh, the just the last point you mentioned there about supplying future standards. Now, are you talking about LTN 120 specifically? Correct. Yeah. Okay. So the um, the LTN 120 um, it is a new um, government standard. Um, we're not under any legal obligation to follow it. However, we have resolved in an executive decision this year to um, to apply LTN 120 to new schemes that are coming forward. And those are already in the design process, um, such as the ones we're considering tonight, um, to try and embrace the principles of LTN 120 where we can. So I think uh, the schemes are quite a good fit for LTN 120. Obviously, they don't comply completely, but they comply um, you know, quite a lot of the way, and they do comply with the adopted guidance and policy of the Council at this time. Um, one of the other points, then, if we're going through them in reverse order, was um, the scheme designed to maximise the flow of vehicles. Uh, what reassurances we have that isn't at the expense of pedestrians and cyclists? So, so I think that's specifically on the Western Gateway. Um, so the Western Gateway, uh, it's worth saying that it is a highway mitigation scheme for the, uh, the, the, the traffic that will be caused by the South Wilkin Distributor Road and um, the 1,800 extra houses that are coming forward. Um, but it's important to say that the, the junction as it is at the moment, the mini right about, is creaking. Um, if we do nothing, if we don't build a distributor road and we don't have any housing, um, the junction will be over capacity in future and there will be substantial queues developing all down the road, um, you know, lots of cars belching out fumes and nothing moving very well. So we do need to do something at that junction, even if these developments don't come forward. So the mitigation that's been put forward um, has, it is a big junction, it's been modelled with the improved Tesco junction to the north as a linked junction assessment and it brings about considerable benefits in terms of the free flow of traffic through that junction in the future. Um, so no no queues of you know half a kilometre stretching down the road. In fact, I think the maximum queue in future is something like five vehicles, um, which is clearly completely manageable. Um, it does as well, like I say, it's primarily a highway um, capacity scheme to address that issue, that traffic's not getting through the junction. But the design team have taken the opportunity as well to create and extend existing cycle routes in the area to add in additional um, toucan crossings, uh, which can be used by pedestrians and cyclists. Um, you know, as far as they can, I think we do need to recognise, as was mentioned earlier in the evening, that you know Finch Hampstead Road has limited width within the highway boundary um, to 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 get substantial you know improvements without taking out. A lot of people's front gardens. So I think the scheme is quite a good balance in addressing the key issue of, of, of capacity at that junction whilst you know extending and, and providing more pedestrian cycle facilities there. Okay, thank you. Who's going to take the issue about railway bridges, please? And the fact that the um, in, it was suggested in the core strategy that there needed to be improvements uh, to those bridges and that, that, that nothing is specifically proposed in these series of applications. I'm happy to take that one as well. Um, so the scheme uh, for Western Gateway that's before us tonight doesn't um, prejudice works being done to the railway bridges, as mentioned in the, the core strategy. Um, Clearly, those works to the railway bridges would be extremely disruptive. They would close the road for a number of years and, you know, have, have an impact on, on the town centre. They would be extremely costly. You know, we would have needs to liaise with network rail and there would be implications as well on, on the flow of, um, of trains on the line. Um, but the scheme doesn't 
Bridges is doing it in future. Um, you know, we, we have looked at the amount of HGVs that are currently going under the bridge, and it's something between 10 and 20 in the peak hour, depending whether you look at the AM or the PM peak hour. So um, it's not saying we won't ever do it, it's just not part of this scheme tonight. And in terms of pedestrian and cycle movements in the area, if you think back to the slide that Emmy showed as part of her presentation, um, there is a whole um, network of pedestrian cycle improvements coming in the area related to the um, South Wokenham Consortium's uh, pedestrian cycling strategy. So there's going to be a whole network of, of, of improvements to you know cater for, um, well, to partly address that issue with the pinch point under the railway bridge. OK, thank you. Um, I'll just turn it over to members uh, now. Um, Angus, you're a, you're a ward member. I think I'll come to you first. Chairman, before I start, could, could I understand how we're going to proceed now? Are we going to deal with each of the applications well, separately? Because, we, uh, we, will, we will discuss all the applications because of the, the very nature of them being interlinked. But it will be helpful if you, when you spoke, you indicated which application you were referring to. And I don't think there's a need for numbers. It can just be the roundabout, the distributed road, the SANGs, or either of the two packages of housing. I think that's the simplest way to do it. But when we come to take votes on these, we will take all of these votes separately. Okay. So, yeah. Rick, sorry to interrupt, but a further procedural point. Um, as we're potentially commenting on five applications, we're not, I presume, going to be limited to three minutes. Mem members have never been limited in what they have to say. Good, thank uh, you. But you, you you do need to bear in mind one key thing: um, the 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 amount of time available is finite, and the planning committee, the next planning committee, will be a different makeup of members. So that if this is not something we conclude tonight, the new people are going to have to do it all over again. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Chairman. I'll try and delete any slightly extraneous points that I had intended to make. But starting on the uh, uh, on the distributor road, uh, condition six uh, and little six on page 62 leaves ongoing concerns which local members have raised at every stage through the safe crossing of the railway at Star Lane Crossing, especially for pedestrians and cyclists, and especially for school people accessing home grain school and later the primary school from the town, as well as access to and from the proposed housing and the town centre. There's only a narrow path at the crossing, more trains per hour are planned, and there were rail plan and off-site control of the level crossing in Felton. Uh, Para 120 refers, but I, I stress the essential need to address the problem, which, which uh, um, Emmy did mention about, but uh, I think it's a point which we feel is one of the serious safety concerns as things are standing at the moment. Um, unfortunately, Network Rail dismissed the ideal solution of a tunnel uh, some 200 metres to the east, um, where um, this would have taken the problem away from the level crossing. Uh, two later parts of that condition on page 62 confirmed that HGVs can travel across the Heathlands East Hampstead Road, uh, which will allow many HGVs accessing the fruit growers, Hall Hunter, Squires Garden Centre and Birchingham's Farm complex to travel this way rather than the unsuitable arrangements via traffic lights of Heathlands Road Nine Mile Ride as at present. Uh, so really, I think my point here is stressing the need for MOVA technology there to, to improve uh, the flow. Um, on the general principle of the road, I think we, we support because um, traffic at the moment has to go through Wokingham Town Centre, though a lot of it is wanting to go through the town centre. Um, it um, will reduce traffic on the nine mile ride, perhaps, time will tell. Um, but I think that the, the point here is that um, we that a number of the uh, local residents have continually come to us as local members concerned about the stopping up of East Hampstead Road adjacent to the level crossing. And I'd just like officer comment to confirm that this was considered totally essential. Uh, I know it was covered, but it was a point that was continually raised to us by local members. Um, 
on the saying, um, yes, it is perhaps unfortunate it's across the railway line, uh, but at least that is closer and more accessible than going to the uh, the um, Thames Space Neath uh, special protection areas. So uh, uh, it's perhaps regrettable also that there's no access to the straight off that one to make a circular route up towards Copy Beach Roundabout. But I think otherwise it's approved by network uh, by Natural England, so we have to go with that. On the main housing development, uh, delighted that permitted development uh, will not be allowed. Um, I think I can skip those points. Um, I have slight concern uh, if we look at Paris 176, 177, the impact on the amenity uh, of local housing from the proposed primary school up near the Star Lane crossing. And will the school be subject to a separate planning application when it comes forward? So this can be addressed as to any uh, effects on the housing. Um, point I've made before in committee on electric um, car charging. Uh, I note in the report the current and possible new standards of provision, but will we ensure the supply from the grid to each street would allow 100% provision uh, if people were all going to switch on their cars? Um, uh, where are we now? I was concerned that the application and for 190914 that monies are suggested to be allocated and this is on page 304 paragraph 52 to sites in Barkham and Finch Hampstead and not to the local impacts this development will generate is the case proven of need in Barkham because of this development and there's no more local schemes such as on Nymar Ride in working without that could be addressed um, on the smaller housing development um, I've mentioned about the saying um, I think on two or three times in these applications it's mentioned about the 10% biodiversity net gain which is great um, but I do hope every effort and, and a, maybe assurance from officers that this be achieved on site rather than off site contribution uh, and the last point, I think, uh, is to asking for assurance that any road which may have a bus route through it is built wide enough. We have in the past built developments in this borough with the idea that buses could go through it, and when they were built, they couldn't. Uh, so that assurance would also be uh, ideal. Thank you. Okay, um, thank you. So we, I think the questions that I got from, from those points that we need uh, uh, brief answers from the officers on us. The stopping up, stopping up of East Hampstead Road, uh, the fact that the school would be a separate application, the issue relating to passive and active EV charging, uh, and that the uh, bus road widths, uh, road widths are adequate for buses where they're likely to travel, because we had that problem elsewhere, I think in, particularly in Shinfield, and also that the proposed off-site off junction works seem to include a, a lot of areas out, well outside of the area, and I think you were particularly referring to Heathlands Road and Ride Junction? Well, there's other, uh, other issues in the local area r okay. rather than in Barkham. Okay, all right. So um, I'm not sure whether that will be Emmy or somebody from Highways, but those are those uh, points summarised, please. Go ahead. I'm happy to take some of those and then perhaps if I don't cover anything, Emmy or Connor can, can jump in. Um, so just on the point about the Star Lane crossing, uh, we do have an indicative scheme from the developer at the moment which shows um, new minimum three metre wide um, ped cycle routes on both sides of East Hampstead Road, south of the railway level crossing on the approach. Um, it's an indicative design still obviously covered by planning condition and you know, the detail of that design would need to come but clearly that is an improvement on what's there at the moment and, and I understand that the um, 
developer is willing if there's a little bit more stacking or queuing space required for pedestrians and cyclists when the railway barrier is down that that can be provided um, north of the railway line it's it's a section 106 contribution towards the council to continue whatever route benefits we can through um, obviously there are some constraints there with existing um, highway you know highway uh, boundary and, and, and properties and so on that would need to be looked at um, the Heathlands Junction improvement, um, so just to confirm that that does provide MOVA um, software at that junction, so it's, it's upgrading the junction completely to work more um, um, cleverly, basically, putting in brand new ducting at the junction and also creating some space for a maintenance bay. So, um, so um, that's quite a good improvement. It's probably worth saying as well that the, the developments didn't actually um, cause a very severe impact at that junction. Um, so it, it's quite good that, that we're getting a, a, a mitigation scheme out of the developer. Um, the other junctions that are being improved, um, so as Emmy said in her, um, her presentation, there was, I think, over 20 junctions that were looked at in the local area. And um, the ones that are being improved, I think it's about eight, are the ones that clearly the development had uh, an impact on. We, we can't get any sort of mitigation out of the developer unless it's, you know, um, directly attributable to their development. They can't fix existing problems on the highway network, much as we might like them to. Um, it has to be directly related to their impact. So there's been a considerable amount of jun junction assessment work um, carried out. Um, to justify that work. Um, the EV charging, um, yes, we, we do have some standards for that, which are operating quite successfully within the borough. Um, there's always concern about whether there's enough power in the network, um, but really that comes down to the developer having a conversation with the national grid and with the distribution network operator at an early stage. And these days, um, you know, we do have a load balancing um, um, technology that's out there so that, you know, if everyone charges their car in at the same time, the whole network doesn't fall over and um, it just might, might mean it gets charged up a little bit more slowly or you know you can't watch EastEnders that night or something like that but it does balance the um, the requirements for the whole um, for the whole load across the whole site um, and I think the final point was just about the bus route so just to confirm that the um, distributor road um, has a width of 7.3 meters which is adequate for a bus route the minimum um, recommended by the government is 6.5 um, so that should be acceptable. Could I just come back on that last point, Chairman? Uh, I understood the buses were going to actually go off the SDR to serve, service some of the residential areas, and that was what was concerning me. The, the bus route is due to primarily go down the South Oak and Distributor Road um, and through the parcels at the eastern end and then along the existing highway network towards Bracknell. So it'll basically, the route will run between um, Bracknell Station and, um, and Wokenham uh, Rail Station. Um, so, yeah, we're quite happy that it's, um, I mean, some, some, some of the parts of the network already um, are obviously used by buses, so there, there shouldn't be any issues there. Um, thank you, Judy. I think the one you didn't cover, unless I misheard you, was the stopping up of East Hampstead Road. I think that was the point you asked, Angus. Yeah, I might just have to have that one repeated if that's all right. I didn't quite hear what the question was. I, I was. I, I think I know the answer. I, I was just uh, feeling I needed to represent the continuing concerns of the local residents as to the need for that stopping up and just an assurance that all the safety checks and all did lead to that conclusion. Yeah, so the requirement for the stopping up um, or the prohibition of driving, it, it came down to the, the functioning of the South Wokenham Distributor Road Junction with East Hampstead Road in close proximity to the uh, railway level crossing junction. Um, so what we've done is we factored in the additional trains that are going to be running in the future and the additional traffic that was going to be on the network. Uh, we created a micro simulation um, sort of transport model just to look at that area in detail. And as Emmy mentioned earlier, um, it could only really work if the East Hampstead Road South Wokenham Distributor Junction was was a huge junction that had um, master planning kind of consequ consequences for the for the whole development. Um, took up quite a lot of land and so on. So that's why we've got the alternative um, arrangement where we have what's called the Heathlands Link Road that comes down from 
the size of a distributor. Okay, okay. Um, thank you. I think the uh, the only point that you covered, Angus, that hasn't been covered, and I suspect this will be over to ME, is the confirmation that the, the proposed primary school will be subject to a separate application. Is that correct? Um, it's part of the outline planning permission that's sought now. Um, so it wouldn't be an application for full planning permission. It would require approval of reserve matters and all the conditions that are proposed now on the application for phase 2B would apply to it as well. That would be a two-form entry school at this point. It would be. Well, that's proposed, but we're getting if the land transferred to the council as part of this application and delivery will be by the council from SIL. So it will be entirely in the council's hands exactly what is delivered on the site. Right, thank you. Um, I now come to the other ward member, Chris Barring. Chris, did you wish to cover yes. points not covered by Angus Ross? Yes, I would. Thank you, Chairman. Um, the um, SWDR, is 30 miles an hour the natural speed? Is that the speed that drivers would drive at um, if there were no uh, traffic restrictions, speed restrictions? Are there other questions? If we could just make a note of them and okay. then we'll, we'll Sorry. Um, answers to them. Yeah. It's been said that um, cyclists will cycle uh, along the shared area of the road, but will also use the main road. Is, is it possible to put in some um, some indication that we have on Reading Road, for example, if there's enough room to do that, um, to warn drivers to watch out for uh, cyclists who choose to do that? I'm... I don't quite understand why the safety question at Star Lane level crossing it doesn't seem to be a matter for us and we seem to be just leaving it to Network Rail to do it in planning terms. Is that correct? And the last point about road safety audits. Um, it's very difficult for lane members to work out whether a roundabout or a shared space is safe. So do we have road safety audits for both the roundabouts for the shared space on the on the main road and also for the railway bridges despite the fact there aren't any works there. Thank you. Okay. Um, Judy, I guess the 30 mile an hour, uh, I guess they're mainly questions for you, so over to you again, please. Could I ask you to speak up a little, please, as well? Yes, absolutely. Um, so the road has been designed to a 30 mile an hour speed limit and um, that would that would be one of the things that would be addressed through the road safety audit process as well, whether there's any issues of, you know, risk that vehicles might do it in excess of that. But I would say that given the, the nature of the design with the central crossing islands, the landscaping, the, the, the curving geometry and so on, um, those are all features that are going to keep the road to a 30 mile an hour speed limit, with, as with the sort of North Wokenham, South Wokenham um, SDL sites. Um, to pick up, just move on onto the road safety audit. Um, so we would require a road safety audit on any change that was proposed to the highway. Um, so it would cover the entire schemes, basically the, the the extent of the SWDR and the extent of the Western Gateway. Um, they're in, they're sort of a prelim design at the moment, so they've been subject to stage one road safety audit. When they move on to detailed design or discharge of condition stage, there would be a stage two audit done on the detailed design. And then there would be a stage three audit done before the scheme was open to the public to make sure it was safe to use. And then after the scheme had been open for a while, 18 months or 12 months, it would be subject to a stage four audit where you would look back at how well it had performed and whether there had been any accidents or anything like that. Um, in terms of the cyclists, um, so you're going to get different types of cyclists for sure. The, the, the really keen ones will want to be on the road because they can get up a maximum speed. And they're not going to be hindered by side road junctions and so on. Um, the more leisure cyclists or parents cycling to school with kids are more likely to be on the, um, the shared routes um, that are segregated from the carriageway. Um, you, you can obviously put up warning signs and so on to drivers but that would just have to be looked at as part of the detailed design and, and justifying um, whether it was going to be effective or not you know against the sort of um, um, sort of subject of um, street decluttering and so on I, I think that might have been all of them unless there was something in Star Lane which I didn't quite pick up what the question was sorry Wait, was it would it be possible to put a lane marking actually for the cyclists on the highway Right. There wouldn't be enough width for that. So like I say, there's a 7.3 metre wide carriageway and it does uh, narrow down where you've got the central refuge crossing islands along the road. It does narrow down to sort of 3.65 um, 
sort of curb to curb um, width. So if you were to look to put in a, a dedicated cycleway, you, you wouldn't really have the room within the road to do that. Okay, uh, sorry, with, with the bridges, um, do you, you cover what, what's happening under the bridges because a lot of people have said that it might be unsafe for pedestrians because the uh, extra traffic. So even though um, the bridges aren't part of the scheme directly, I don't, don't think they're in the red line, um, th you would still look at those as part of the uh, assessing the safety of what, what, what's happening. Well, the, the auditor would look at um, the scheme itself, plus how it sort of ties into what is there in you know on the ground already. Um, it's probably worthwhile mentioning as well that, as I said earlier, we're, we're not prejudicing doing works to the bridge in future. I mean, to a certain extent, we need to build the South Wilkinham Distributor Road and we need to improve the Western Gateway Junction to get the highway capacity in there that could potentially allow us to close Finchampstead Road for, say, two years in future to carry out the works to the bridge. We need to get the network future-proofed first um, to get that in. Thank you. Uh, right, now we move on to non-ward members. I see uh, Carl first, please. Thank you, Chair. Um, yeah, I'm, I've edited mine down as well, Angus, because uh, yeah, I've got quite a lot here, but I'll, I'll try and press it. Um, yeah, my first question was, you know, what is happening with that southern pedestrian crossing uh, on the uh, Western Gateway? Um, but obviously that has been sort of answered. Um, I was really worried about the, those sight lines on that uncontrolled crossing. That, that, I'm glad that's being removed. Um, uh, I think um, there's something strange going on here, I think. I mean, this has been referred to as a long design process, and yet we've heard from Mr. Bowker there that, you know, a month ago things changed. We've heard that there was from Councillor Kerr that there was talks with Network Rail that didn't seem to go anywhere. Um, and obviously we've had a change in the last 24 hours, uh, even from the agenda we've had just a week ago. Um, so something that strange going on, I think, in the design process, and I'm not happy. I, we've got a, a condition here in the members' update saying that that uncontrolled crossing will be removed, and I'm happy that that's there and I'd support that. What I'm worried about is why we don't have a condition saying that there will be a crossing uh, further down. It, it seems that it'd be quite easy for a quick condition to have said there will be a crossing. That doesn't seem like it's very difficult. It sounds like that's what's going to happen, so I, I don't see why that can't be in there. Um, Moving on, um, some of the, again, this is still on the Western Gateway. It, I get confused, um, really. I mean, I'm a layman, so I'm going to need the traffic people to describe this to me. But this is all about improving capacity. Um, it, it says that on page 21. Uh, on page 22, it talks about the modelling assessments would indicate the junctions would provide the surplus capacity is required to accommodate the increased traffic flows resulting from the SWDR. And... In my mind, I, I, the way I kind of tried to visualise this, it's like an hourglass, you know, where you've got the restriction in the middle, which is the railway bridge, and you've got two bowls with, you know, a kilo of sand in them, and it, it moves through. It, what we're doing here is making bigger bowls and putting 10 kilos of sand in. But to me, I don't see how it moves faster. You get more in and, you know, maybe a few cars parking around the roundabout. But I'm a bit, I can't understand how this scheme improves the capacity without those bridges being dealt with, or certainly the, the the uh, Southern Bridge being dealt with. Um, so that's that's the question I would like to have answered. Um, uh, okay, trying to cut things out. Um, I don't think it's good enough to kind of... I'm, I'm a cycle commuter. I don't think it's good to have us... This is onto the road now, the, the distribute road. I don't think it's good to have us um, on the same shared area as uh, pedestrians. Um the previous LTN, 112, talks about uh, shared reuse routes um, uh, that serve sort of pedestrians poorly likely to be unattractive to cyclists too. If improvements for cyclists can only be realised through a significant reduction in route quality for pedestrians, the scheme is unlikely to be acceptable. So that, this is eight, nine years ago. So, you know, that this, although we're, we're kind of saying the 120 can't really be put in because it's too late, uh, coming to us. Well, the rules before were kind of saying that we should be doing something like this. Um, on page 106, paragraph 93, um, there's a, a bit that says basically a fully shared surface is preferable to creating substandard widths for both pedestrians and cyclists where the available width is three metres or less. And I think that's from 120, and I agree with. But the question here is, why is only three metres available? 
That's the decision that was made by the design authority here. We're not, we're not talking about a road that we're trying to retrofit with this, where we literally don't have the space. We do have the space here, so why wasn't it done? Um, it, it, that just seems strange to me. Um, and we saw that, you know, the Embrook bridge, which I mentioned, you know, is four metres wide. Um, it can be done, clearly. Um, right. Oh, yeah, I'm quite unhappy with the explanation in the report about this. It's in paragraphs 95 and 96 on page 106. It basically talks about a wider footpath and cycleway taking away vegetation and wildlife habitat uh, as a reason we shouldn't make it wider. You know, we're building three kilometres of road and 1,700 houses on a, on a farmer's field, effectively. You know, it's a bit late to start talking about losing a little bit of great grass on the side of the road. Um, Okay, moving on to the SANG. Um, I thank Emmy for the explanation in that, in that uh, application about how we should be deciding on SANGs, and this is a change of use for that particular St Anne SANG. Um, and I have no objection to that as a change of use. And that obviously what I'm going to say now is about uh, the application on the housing, which seeks to use that SANG. Um, we've got to remember the SANGs are there to persuade people to stay local and not drive off to the Thames Basin Heath. That's their only purpose. And I don't think anyone's going to walk from um, the, the smaller set of uh, houses, which that sang is, is, is put against, uh, from there to, to go to this sang. I, I can't imagine anybody walking that distance. It's a very convoluted route. I think Wokingham Town Council referred to it as dubious, and I can agree with that. Um, that ain't going to happen. Um, I don't know whether affordable housing, it's in the application, but I don't know if that is something we're deciding on now. It doesn't seem to be part of the outline, so I just want to check that, really. Um, you wouldn't want me to say nothing about affordable housing, I'm sure. Um, <laughs> yet again. I can, I can assure you, give your assurance, Carl, it is detailed in here that it yeah. would be 35% affordable housing. Yeah, I'm happy with that. And I'm happy with the fact the 70 30% split social rent uh, is there. bit less happy that the affordable rent key worker housing is going to come from the social rent split, but that's something for later. Um, uh, I, I recognise that the, uh, the healthcare issue, um, the CCG not giving us any comments, uh, and the fact that that's not really... People will be shocked in public, but that's not a planning reason for us to refuse it. Um, but, you know, it, it, that really shows you how bad the system is. <laughs> we we can't actually force that to happen. It's crazy. I think we all agree that's, that's silly. Um, I think that might be everything. Should, should we take some of those points then? Yeah. Carl, is that okay? Take some, so, um, again, uh, for officers, um, the traffic capacity. Um, uh, uh, Carl expressed concerns that there would be there was not a, a substantiated increase in traffic capacity uh, through the proposed new three-arm roundabout. I do recall officers, I think, mentioned a 500-metre queue as opposed to a few vehicles queuing. Uh, as somebody who has to use that route, sometimes I, I know that the 500-metre queue often extends down beyond San Martin's golf course, which is a, a, an awful lot more than 500 metres. So if we could get some clarity on how, how the roundabout increases capacity for through through flow despite the bridges being a constraint um, the, the comments were made about the with the new road that the combined footway cycleways or the shared surface would only be three meters wide and how much easier it would have been to make it slightly wider and um, we've already confirmed the issue on the 35 percent affordable so primarily i think the traffic capacity uh, versus the the constraint of the bridges and uh, why we went for a three metre wide shared surface on the new uh, distributor road. I'm happy to take those. Um, so the uh, the Western Gateway Junction, the, the reason you're able to get more traffic through it simply is it's a much larger rounds by. So the circulatory carriageway uh, around the, the central island has, has been increased. Uh, also, you've increased flare at each of the three arms to the junction and two lane approaches. So you can get one car going straight ahead whilst the other one's turning left. So those sorts of things tend to... Um, really hold up um, the performance of, of, of a junction. Um, just to touch base on that, uh, the the um, 
a junction tends to be over capacity um, when it's RFC figure ratio of fluid capacity is over 100 85 percent starts kind of causing concern so like I say without doing anything in the future it's, it's going to be over capacity um, this mitigation scheme has been assessed in the junctions 9 industry standard software with the extra lanes the larger roundabout the flares and so on and it brings the capacity down to below 85 percent which is a threshold of concern um, so I think that's well, the other thing to, to mention on that as well was the, the the restriction for the railway bridge. It's a height restriction. It's not a width restriction. So the the, the carriageway underneath the rail bridge is uh, still over six metres wide. Um, so the concern there is is the height restriction and that large sided vehicles would need to pull into the centre of the road to get through. But, but as I mentioned earlier, we're only talking about um, between 10 to 20 HGVs in, in the peak hour. So it's not a considerable figure. Um, moving on to the three metre wide um, ped cycle routes. So again, this is going back to what the the policy was, what was adopted, the core strategy, the, the you know the, the vision through the um, supplementary planning documents, and, and three metres has been provided elsewhere um, to the east through the Eastern Gateway application through Montague Park. Um, it, it works quite well, to be honest. If you go down to the Floria at Montague Park Primary School in the PCAR, there's there's kids walking, cycling, scooting all over the place. There's parents walking, pushing prams and so on. Um, there are some benefits to be said for the route being unsegregated and shared, because I'm sure not a lot of parents would like to be walking on one side of the track whilst their young child cycles on the other side of the track. So I think that is important to say. Um, and although the, the cycle route is three metres wide, it's, it's worth mentioning as well that there is a buffer of half a metre to either side of that. So it's a grass strip, um, which, which uh, you know, it, it improves the, the, you know, you can get right up to the edge of it on your bike. Um, also, I mean, that's available to retrofit in future if, if, if we realise, you know, to five, ten years down the line that we want to widen it, that the cycle and pedestrian numbers are higher than we've ever imagined. Um, so I think just to, just to confirm really that three metres is what we've put in throughout the rest of the SDL sites, it's working well. There's not been any issues. Um, it, it does create and continue a coherent route, building on what's already been delivered um, immediately to the east. Okay, thank you. Um, if we could now come on to Stephen Conway. Uh, thank you, Chairman. Um, I must confess, uh, when I first saw this agenda, I thought uh, we're going to have a very, very long discussion on uh, the two housing sites. Uh, in reality, we've hardly touched upon the two housing sites, which is rather interesting. Um, and I think there's good reason for that, because the principle of development is very clearly established. There's nothing we can do about the fact that there are two very significant housing developments going to take place. However, there are aspects of this that I think it, it is important to mention. Uh, I have essentially four concerns about the, the two housing developments. One of them, which relates also to uh, the South Wokingham Distributor Road, which is the um, impact on the setting of the listed buildings. There are some really valuable listed buildings uh, in or near these developments, and they're all going to be quite profoundly affected uh, we're placing our faith entirely in screening, and I'm not at all convinced that screening is really going to uh, enable us to maintain the quality of the setting of those listed buildings. Uh, Emmy mentioned the value of green spaces being highlighted during the pandemic, which is surely true. I think appreciation of the built environment has also been highlighted as people have been walking more and uh, I've certainly walked in that area and come across listed buildings I wasn't aware of before. And really those, I'm afraid, are not going to have the same um, setting uh, for future generations, which is a great sadness. I, I am also concerned, as I'm sure we all are, about uh, the erosion of the, the gap between settlements. Um, Wokingham and Bracknell are going to be coming uh, less than a, a kilometre apart, that's a very small gap. We're, we're, we're really in danger of this becoming a, ma a massive urban sprawl. Um, there is a bit of concern, understandably, about the proximity of the proposed new dwellings to existing dwellings around the perimeter. 
um, we're assured on pages three to two to six that the distances all comply, and I expect that's correct, so they can't be pursued, but it is going to have a dramatic impact on those uh, uh, adjacent residents. And finally, on, on the, the two housing applications, I've got more to say on other things, I'm afraid, uh, that four-storey element that's promised uh, is, is really does seem to be out of keeping, as far as I can see, with uh, what we know of, of design in, in Wokingham itself. Uh, I, I imagine we're really committed to that uh, in order to deliver the number of new dwellings on the site. But I, I think everything that could be done to avoid four-storey should be done. Um, so I really want to turn now to the three, uh, um, as it turned out, much more contentious applications we've been looking at this evening. Uh, and I'll start with what to me is perhaps the least contentious of those three, and that's the SANG. Uh, I agree with earlier speakers that this is not the ideal location, far from it. However, uh, I'm not quite sure what we can do about that. We either have the SANG there or we don't have a SANG. So I'm afraid, I, I fear there's nothing we can do. It's certainly not the optimal site for it, but um, I don't think there's a great deal we can do about that. However, I do think on the other two applications, that's the new roundabout or the Western Gateway and the South Wokingham Distributor Road, there are things we can do and there are things we should seek to do. Uh, so if we can take those two in order, and I'll start with the Western Gateway, the new roundabout. Uh, there's been a lot of concern expressed about the removal of the control crossing and there's a genuine anxiety and I think it's very legitimate that until, well, even with a new uh, southern crossing, control crossing, the desire line for many people will still be to go across where the currently con uh, controlled, uncontrolled crossing is. Um, so we, we really um, have a risk, I think, to, to safety of pedestrians here. Um, there really doesn't seem to be uh, adequate recognition of the needs for pedestrians and cyclists in the new Western Gateway scheme. And there certainly doesn't seem to be adequate protection for the resident of number 96, Finch Hampstead Road. And um, all of those concerns seem to me to suggest that we should be looking for revisions of this scheme to try and actually address these problems. With the South Wokingham Distributor Road, um, the fundamental problem, it seems to me, is um, the mixed or, or the shared space provision for pedestrians and cyclists. Um, now, as I see it, LTN 1 through 20 is really here to encourage um, cyclists and pedestrians to feel safe. It's about their safety, giving them confidence to be able to... Um, use uh, this facility uh, of, of being able to walk or cycle rather than going in, in their cars. This is something we all, I think, applaud and all want to see happen. But I'm afraid what has been designed here with this shared uh, footpath and cycleway does not seem to me to be likely to achieve that objective. Uh, Obviously, this is a complicated issue. There are arguments on both sides. I accept the points raised by highways officers about this. But it does seem to me that Carl hit the nail on the head when he said, surely the answer is we can actually uh, create a wider space which could be then segregated properly to ensure that we don't have this kind of potential for conflict, um, uh, which may end up reducing usage. So I, I would suggest, uh, Chairman, um, that although there's been an enormous amount of work put into all of these applications by our officers, and I do respect all of that work, and I appreciate I'm approaching this as a lay person, I really do think both the Western Gateway and the South Wokingham Distributor Road need revision in, in the schemes that have been put forward. These are relatively... Uh, small, uh, you could argue, 
uh, I do understand the point made by both Jean and Emmy that any revisions of these schemes would add costs and may cause delay. Um, but I think we have to weigh those considerations, the cost and delay considerations in the scales alongside what to me is a much more fundamental consideration, and that's the safety of, of our residents, safety of cyclists and pedestrians. And I certainly won't feel able to support these two applications in their existing form. And I would hope that other members of the committee would support the idea of our uh, deferring. We can either refuse or we can defer. I welcome advice on that. Uh, applications 203535 and application 192928 so that we can get revisions that address the concerns that have been expressed by many members of this committee. Thank, thank you, Stephen. Um, just to pick up specifically on some of the points that I think you raised, the, some good points, the, uh, that we probably need answers, we can get some answers on now, which is the, uh, the officer's view on the, probably for you, Emmy, the impact on the setting of listed buildings. Um, the, your comment about working on Bracknell getting very close together now, I think our hands are slightly tied there because this is the core strategy to define a, 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 a development of this scale here. Uh, but I think the other point that would be worth exploring is the four-storey element. Obviously, it goes without saying that the more higher-rise buildings there are, the less green space is used up. So there's a balance, and I, I, I can't remember, I think the... Uh, the density here was quite reasonable uh, looking at the overall scheme. Um, so, Emmy, could you uh, just enlighten us as to how we've evaluated the impact on the setting of listed buildings and uh, the four-storey element? Thank you. Yes, certainly. Um, as far as the listed buildings are concerned, um, the environmental impact assessments include heritage assessments, which look in quite a lot of detail at the impact and all of them. Clearly, they do have a rural setting at the moment. So the fact the site has been designated for development will inevitably have an impact to some degree. And it varies depending on which particular group of listed buildings you're talking about. Probably Britain's Farm is the um, most affected due to the proximity of the road. Um, but the um, assessments have been reviewed both by the council's own conservation officer and Historic England. Um, there have been some changes to the proposals to increase the width of some of the buffers as a result of that. And they're now happy that with the um, separation distances and the landscaping schemes proposed, the impacts are acceptable. And I'd say in particular, I mean, clearly the most sensitive listed building is the Lucas Hospital, which is grade one listed. Um, and you've got Sang and the Ancient Woodland adjoining that and separating it from the uh, nearest development. Um, I think building heights, um, the approach proposed is very similar to, um, or it's in line with the supplementary planning document. It's also similar to the approach taken in Montague Park and um, North Wokingham. And what they're talking about is um, predominantly two and two and a half storey, rising to three storey in some landmark locations. The only places where four storey are proposed are around the neighbourhood centre where you're actually looking for something that stands out and is perhaps slightly different to um, the, the rest of the area because it needs to be identified as the focus of the development. And in the vicinity of the bridge over the railway line where the bridge itself is quite a big structure. And again, that's very much consistent with Montague Park, where you've got buildings of the same height being built in the neighbourhood centre that is approaching completion there. Um, in terms of separation of settlements, I think Simon's right, you know, the fact of, of designating the SDL um, is ever, inevitably going to have an impact. Um, I went through in some detail in the report looking at the separation distances um, that would be achieved and also comparing to what's happened at Montague Park and some of the developments further north along the boundary there. And I think the separation distances here are relatively generous compared to others. And you've got sort of ancient woodland and sang um, in Bracknell in between. So I think that gap is likely to be protected in the longer term as well. I think um, there was also mention of proximity to new dwellings. And I think the separation distances in the between the Sort of proposed development parcels 
and the new dwellings are not just complying with standards but actually really quite generous in most cases so I feel very confident that uh, when we get to reserve matters there shouldn't be any issues in achieving appropriate um, separation distances there but certainly the reserve matters will be an opportunity to sort of scrutinise that in more detail and then I think finally there was the question about the um, SANG and the sort of ability for people to walk there and um, stay local I think the, the Natural England Guidance for Quality Standards on SANG um, assesses that within 400 metres, um, people will generally walk to a SANG and, um, rather than driving. And there's no requirement to provide parking where SANGs are within 400 metres of the housing there to serve. And the vast majority of the SDL is in within 400 metres of one of the SANGs. Because I think the thing to remember is a member of the public visiting will not perceive St Anne's and Montague Park as two separate sangs. They will see it as one large area of open space that they can just walk over the bridge into the sang and then be enjoying the relatively um, sort of semi-rural character of the sang. Um, so I think they are an appropriate distance. Um, and I think the fact you've got two more generous spaces rather than more fragmented um, provision will make them more attractive to people because they'll have a choice of routes within the larger open area rather than being constrained to just sort of taking a single route rather around a smaller area of open space. Um, I think that's okay. it. OK, thank you. Um, we'll now come on to uh, next two Sorry. speakers. Sorry. 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 Can I jump in for a second just to answer some of the points raised by Stephen? Sorry, Sorry. who's... Sorry, Connor. Connor. Yeah. yeah, go ahead, Connor. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, I've been obviously listening here in the background to a lot of the members' concerns. Um, I think the LT120 seems to be, uh, and, and the application of that guidance seems to be a major concern. Uh, what I would point out is it is still guidance. Um, our other roads are built to uh, to the standard we're looking to do here. We don't have any reports of accidents. Um, the, the road safety audits all passed on those roads, so there's there's no there's no safety implication as such. Um, I, I think in terms of the fifteen percent land take, which is required for it, I think it's probably it doesn't sound a lot, but it actually has significant consequences on the council. So there's a there's a, a delay in terms of the redesign of the road. Um, and the significant cost implications to the council in coming forward um, and the significant implications to the actual number of housing we can achieve on South Wokium. Um, and as we all know, the SDLs are designed um, to, to, to uh, not uh, allow speculative housing developments elsewhere where we don't get the infrastructure in that. So if you're starting to pull down the numbers in South Wokium, those houses are going to go somewhere else. Uh, with no infrastructure is the, is the truth. Um, I think it, it will increase speculative appeals coming forward um, because we are talking about a major delay here. We're not talking about six months, 12 months. We're talking years, um, and it could be three to four years because the developers will have to go and renegotiate their options because their housing numbers will come down. They will have to, to do their, uh, their their drawings again to see how many units they can get on. Um, so it's it's not just simply putting two metres on the side of a road. There's also implications with, with obviously flooding. So we need flood compensation with biodiversity because that's also one of the things that, that the road is compensating for. So th th there may be a 15% increase overall, but that has actually a major implication on South Wokium. So I, I think that point needs to really be made clear here for, for the members tonight. So we're talking about significant delays. I've been working on this scheme five years with the rest of the team. We've, we've done an awful lot of work to get to this point. Um, but in essence, we're starting again, potentially, if, if, if it doesn't go forward. Um, I think also um, one of the other things I, I point out is less housing obviously means uh, a road that costs more and less housing means that uh, the, the council has less money to spend on other infrastructure. So things like uh, the, our sports facilities, our community buildings, uh, they will not be funded as well because the money will be going towards the road. So it, it's, it's a balancing act of is the extra meter on either side of the road um, worth considering when actually there's a there's a big implication to the council in terms of cost of appeals, in terms of our housing coming forward, in terms of infrastructure being provided for for the other services that people want, community building, sports, schools. Um, I, I think there are things we need to bear in mind on this. Um, the other thing I, I note that the Western Gateway is is an issue um, in terms of this crossing. If the members would feel more comfortable 
we would be happy to put on a condition to say that the crossing needs to be installed as part of the Western Gateway. So this is the southern crossing, the, the, the signalised uh, crossing on the on the southern arm of Finch Hampstead Road. Um, so I think there are some of the points I'd just like to put across to members um, just to, to make them aware before they, they, they go forward in their decision making. Um, I'm happy to answer any questions after, but I'll leave it there. OK, thank you, Connor. Uh, so the next two people I've registered to speak are Pauline Jorgensen and then Rochelle shepherd Bay. Pauline? Thank you, Chairman. Steering well away from the um, road, I'd like to ask a couple of questions about some other things. Um, the first thing was on page 339, item 30. I didn't understand the uh, the comment about the need for secondary school capacity, um, particularly as it said that there is there would be sufficient capacity in existing schools for admissions in 2020 and 2021, but there may be a need for capital investment in subsequent years. So I don't understand what the solution to that is, bearing in mind we're in 21 already. So that's the first point. The second question, which is more minor, is along the railway, I noticed there was a very fine line of open grassland in between that and what looked like houses. And I just wondered what we were planning or what was being planned to, to to happen to protect the houses that are quite close, I think, if I've understood the plan properly, from the from the train noise and from the rate, trains going backwards and forwards. That was the two questions. Okay, so um, Emmy, the questions were issues about the school capacity as referred to on top of page 339 and the strip of land uh, tightly by the railway, uh, its purpose and function. <laughs> Um, now, as far as education, secondary education is concerned, um, I say it's not a fundamental to determination of this application because the requirement will be met through SIL contributions. Um, I think paragraph 30 was added in um, just to address the points that had been raised through um, consultation. And um, this is what the education um, sort of planning team have advised us. I think there are um, there is a peak, um, and they're looking at measures to kind of address that. Um, but then they'll they'll need to come up with a strategy for addressing that. But as I say, not fundamental to the determination of this application today. Um, the strip of land um, and north along the railway. I think that is a sort of factor of the small scale of the drawing it's actually a lot more substantial than it looks um i think i mentioned in the presentation that most of them were sort of in the high teens or 20 meters wide and a lot of that is actually quite a bit wider um so it's for the green corridor part of the landscaping um in some of the areas where it's wider it's wide enough to accommodate the allotment sites as well um so there and i think what's anticipated there is probably you'll have houses sort of facing northwards towards the railway so there'll be the access to them also increasing the separation and certainly the impact um, of noise from the railway has been considered in the noise assessments um, and they haven't thrown anything up that couldn't be adequately mitigated. Could I just come back with a further question? Yes. Um, well two further questions actually about the, the strip of land will there be trees against the railway to try and mitigate it, it a bit more and the, the school if it takes two years or so to build a secondary school I'm not quite sure how it can not be part of the planning application I think well, the easier answer is that the detailed landscaping scheme for the proposals will um, set out in a lot more detail what happens along that northern landscaped area. Um, and certainly, yes, we would expect that it will include um, additional tree planting. Um, I think the whether or not and the length of time it takes to deliver a secondary school, um, the, the money for secondary education um, for this development will be fill receipts when the houses start to come forward. Um, we're not expecting, there's no policy expectation and there's no indication from education that there's any need for anything to be delivered on site. Um, I think that is a matter for them in their delivery of education. Um, and Because I think certainly the housing for this development will not be coming forward in that period anyway. We're not looking at the housing starting for several years by the time you've been through the process of getting planning permission, um, completing the Section 106 agreement, reserve matters, conditions, and actually getting on site and building houses. Um, so I think the sort of the capacity um, sort of immediately after 2021 will be passed by the time any occupations are coming forward from this development. 
Thank you. So you're saying you're going to be building a school anyway? I think if we can now move on um, to Rochelle Shepherd debate. Okay, since the council has declared a climate emergency, uh, I have a very simple answer for the four meters versus three meters. Since Judy said there was a half of meter on either side of the three meters, we could actually make it four meters very immediately right now, and it would be very simple to do. The chances of the council actually coming back and doing this sometime in the future to do a 50 centimeters on either side uh, is unlikely in the extreme, about as much as um, Boris Johnson suddenly switching parties to labor, um, at least in my opinion. Um, the second thing is about the climate emergency, can we encourage only electric appliances to be used since gas is the leading cause of carbon generation in housing and we are declaring climate emergency or are we just playing with it and just saying we're declaring it and not doing anything? I've got two more questions. I've got two more th points. Um, there's a site for the community building, just the land, no building. And if you know how hard it was to get Montague Park uh, building actually fitted out, I'm not even sure if it actually is fitted out at this point, um, having no building, the chances of it actually getting built is also very unlikely. Lastly, if there are flats there, can we at least learn from the Arborfield fire and not have roof voids. Um, that was the major cause for the spread of the fire. And this is something that should be done. Um, I would encourage to have the um, Royal Berkshire Fire and Rescue Authority to inspect ha buildings as opposed to having private inspectors, which seem to uh, possibly cut corners. It will be explained why there was no protection between the uh, different flats. Okay, I think uh, to be fair, Rochelle, two of the points you mentioned not planning the building regs would be the, the matter that would look at the um, the issues about roof voids and and cladding. That would building regs would also cover your first point, uh, not planning. Um, but the key point you mentioned there is the the potential to use the half a meter, um, what I guess in essence is a grass strip alongside the uh, existing proposed three meter strip. So I'd be very interested to hear officers' thoughts on that, as I'm sure we all would. Hi, um, <clears throat> sorry. Uh, I was just going to mention that the um, the SWGR application has been um, assessed according to the cycling level of service assessment that's set out in the appendix of LTN 120. So for any scheme, uh, to get government funding moving forward, it has to meet the requirements of LTN 120, and there's a whole assessment tool set out in that. Um, the SWDR has been assessed and has got a score of 70% uh, under the cycling level of service assessment test, so it would be eligible if it was being put forward for a government um, funding under um, under LTN 120. So, as I said earlier, it, it does um, conform quite well to LTN 120, um, and we need to be careful here that we're saying it's 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 not suitable in any way. Um, as we said, these three metre wide shared routes have been working um, adequately elsewhere. Um, the, the buffer of half a metre on either side, um, that's something that's required. So, for instance, if, if you have um, a curb, if the cycle way was right next to the road, you would need a half a metre buffer. If it was next to a wall, you would need half a metre buffer because people need to be careful about falling onto the carriageway or you know, scraping their handlebars against a wall. So the half a metre buffer that's generally recommended is provided in this case by the landscape verge on either side. Um, to take that out, put more hard standing in would obviously have an impact on the the the, um, the the visual impact, potentially on some of the rain gardens. I don't know if Connor or Emmy might want to take that up in a little bit more detail. Um, but I just wanted to particularly mention about the cycling level of service assessment and the fact that the scheme does score um, what would be required um, to, to meet the requirements of LTM 120 and to receive government funding. Um, could I also just jump in really quickly on Western Gateway, because I think there was a point earlier that wasn't mentioned. 
Um, so it was the point about number 96, Finch Hampstead Road, and um, concern that the driveways hadn't been shown on the drawings. Um, this isn't considered to be an issue. It certainly wasn't raised at the safety audit stage. I think you can just see by looking at the, the drawings that vehicles should be able to manoeuvre perfectly fine out of that driveway. Um, but it would be the sort of thing that's picked up the stage two road safety audit. And if that island needs to get tweaked or reduced down in size a little bit in any way, that would be picked up. Um, the officer's report as well does state quite clearly that all of the recommendations in the safety audit will be taken forward into detailed design. They will all be addressed. Um, so I don't know if Connor or Emmy had anything else to add to that. Yeah, I think um, I think Michelle, on your comment on the on the kind of increasing the footway, or the cycleway footway, um, and eating into the verge, it, it it in essence it results in a much poorer environment for the users. Um, I mean, you're probably aware. I think the Winner's Reef Road um, at Hatch Farm that has a um, that has a cycleway right on the footway cycleway right on the road. It's not particularly attractive um, to cycle on if you've got kids or you're you're not an experienced cyclist. Um, so I think taking away bits of the verge is, is not a good idea to be honest because it as i say you you're creating an environment that's not actually a, a good one and actually lt120 says that that's what you should be doing so what we're doing is in accordance with lt120 um i think the only difference is it doesn't have four meters so that's three um I, to, to me reading it i think some of the some of the it's, it's a pretty flexible document but i think it's 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 certainly designed for very busy areas where you have railway hubs you have in cities for instance the super highways they have in london um it's more designed for that for a very heavy usage um where you do have a huge amount of cyclists going either way um so i i mean i, I don't know if rochelle wants to add to that i'm not sure but i'm happy to answer would just rochelle could you just come back in briefly because okay. we are now getting under time. very briefly uh, 50, 50 centimetres of verge is not going to encourage anyone to cycle on either side or to walk on a road as opposed to having a full-size path. Uh, if you Even on the Winters Relief Road, if they put 50 centimetres on either side, I don't think it would make any difference as far as uh, anybody actually cycling on them. All right. Thank you. Uh, we now come on to Andrew Mickelbrook. Andrew. Yes, thank you, Chair. Um, I appreciate the need to have a road to provide access to 2,500 homes being built in this location and the many other uh, reasons why the distributor road and the potential benefits of a, this distributor road. Um, however, I do have a number of questions. I have three questions relating to the shared pavement um, for pedestrians and cyclists. Firstly, am I correct in assuming that the likelihood of accidents involving pedestrians and cyclists increases with the numbers of each using a shared pavement? And also that there are many reasons to think and to hope that this will be a popular route for both uh, pedestrians and cyclists. My question is, has any modelling then been done to forecast pedestrian cycle traffic on the shared pavement? Is this something that ought to happen? And the reason for asking this question is that I think it does pertain directly, you know, to the uh, strength or not um, of the um, uh, of the case for segregating um, cyclists and, uh, and pedestrians. Secondly, on page, this is following up on some of the issues that Rochelle has just uh, raised, on pages 106 and 107, um, uh, of course, it's not our job to consider the, it, it is our job, sorry, to consider the application as it stands, not to recommend changes to design. However, it's stated that segregated pedestrians and cyclists would require approximately 15% more land with all of the implications arising from this. I'd like clarification. Um, uh, how wide are the um, uh, verges on most of the distributor road? I'm looking at the map on page 123, and it would seem visually that um, the verge um, seems to be of an equal width um, uh, to, the, um, to the pavement. Um, I've also, I believe, seen drawings that suggest that the verge is three metres uh, wide, at least along sections of the road. So if the shared pavement is 15 metres wide, 15% 15 would be an additional 45 centimetres. Um, it's stated that the three metre wide verges are vital and cannot be uh, encroached on to allow for segregation of pedestrians. Um, but um, you know, could you again please run through the reasons for this? Safety has been mentioned um, uh, to allow for plea uh, tree planting and so forth. Um, but how wide does a verge actually need to be to allow 
for um, um, uh, the safety and for the tree planting and whatever other um, you know, reasons there may be for having the, uh, the verges. Um, on page, um, so um, Councillor Mather um, talked about concerns relating to the railway bridges, the two railway bridges, um, and this has been raised a number of times. My question on this is, who would be responsible for making any modifications to these? Specifically, to what extent does network rail, rail influence what may or may not be, be possible and what implications does that have for us, uh, might that have for us um, uh, as a council? Um, in terms of biodiversity net gain, and I'd like to restrict this uh, uh, specifically to the uh, distributor road. Um, a projected net loss is acknowledged on page 102, but with potential for gains to be achieved, so that would be good. The reference in point 75 to any shortfall fall in on-site biodiversity net gain implies that there is some sort of a target, which I believe in other locations has often been plus 10%, an improvement in bio net biodiversity of 10%. Can officers confirm what the target is uh, for the um, uh, for the uh, distributor uh, road. Um, my final question is very specifically about the roundabout at Molly Miller's and Finch Hampstead Road, and specifically on page 51, um, the map showing the exit for numbers 92 and 94 onto Finch Hampstead Road. It's not clear to me exactly what the... Um, uh, exit entry and exit positions um, provision is going to be for them and just how safe um, it would be for those two homes. Um, my final point, if I may, is that um, I have listened to all the presentations, the questions and answers um, uh, tonight and also in the members briefing that we had um, and all the documentation you know, in our um, uh, resources pack and so forth. And I myself am at the moment minded to support Councillor Conway's suggestion that we consider recommending seeking, um, uh, sending back um, applications 203, 535 and 192, 928 for revisions that would address some of the significant concerns raised by many people. Um, I think if we were to do that, obviously we would need to be very clear um, that the officers have understood um, um, uh, exactly what the these um, revisions would be, or the areas in which you know we would be seeking uh, seeking revisions, should that be um, uh, considered? Thank you. Okay. Um, before, uh, sorry, Mr. Chair, may I propose that the meeting is extended if necessary to fine. You beat me to it. I was just checking on the time. Um, um, would members agree to the meeting being extended? as we are allowed to do to 11 o'clock. On the clear understanding, there is no possibility of extension after 11 o'clock. There simply isn't. So any decisions on boats and things will be have to taken well before then to get those comfortably through. Could members please indicate if they support that? And that is unanimously carried. Thank you. So, um, officers, uh, Andrew Mickelberg has raised a number of points. Um, the issues were... The, the modelling uh, relating to pedestrians and cyclists on, on, on the shared surface, uh, the 15% extra land take uh, when compared with the map showing in places that the, the verge seemed to be significantly wider than half a metre, um, the, the, the control or influence network rail have over the bridge or the bridges, uh, the, the biodiversity net gain, uh, the exit for the new for the properties onto that are currently enter onto Finchipstead Road now being moved. Uh, I think if we could take those points, please. In terms of modelling the future level of pedestrians and cyclists on the the routes, um, that's quite difficult to do. Um, we don't really know. It. In particular, um, what we do have is we have some um, school travel survey data from Floria at Montague Park Primary School, um, which would indicate that 
the level of sort of pupils walking, cycling, scooting or park and striding to school would be about 230 pupils for a two form entry um, primary school. Um, the, the unsegregated width of three metres, which is acceptable in LTM 120, is considered acceptable for routes where there's up to 300 pedestrians and up to 300 cyclists at the peak hour. So our best data at this point shows us that that, that is fine. Um, in terms of the verges, and Connor can jump in if he likes, I understand that they're mostly three metres wide, um, but they do have got a lot of stuff in them. Um, they've got uh, rain gardens, they've got trees, uh, they've got street lighting and so on. And things like trees and street lighting obviously need to be offset from the carriageway a certain amount so that people's wing mirrors and so on don't clash with them. Similarly, they need to be outside that half a metre buffer zone that I mentioned earlier for um, the cycle route. Um in terms of the, I um, also wanted to just mention that there, there are all other alternative cycle routes available other than the one alongside the South Wokenham Distributor Road. So there will be routes through the residential parcels in future. There's a cycle route through the sign, as Emily mentioned earlier, a quiet route along Luckley Track and so on. So people will naturally disperse out along these and take the, you know, the most direct line to where they want to go. Um, the rail bridges, um, so I mean, clearly we do need to work very closely with Network Rail if we're looking to replace a railway bridge. You know, not only do they need to be involved in the design and the approval of that, but also the practicalities over the construction, the line closures and so on. Um, so that would very much need to be a collaborative effort between, um, you know, two public bodies. Um, I think that was that was everything. Hey, thank you for the transport related answers. There was issues about the biodiversity net gain and uh, the new, uh, the proposed new exits onto Molly Miller's Lane for the houses you, you mentioned, very close to the three-lane, three-arm roundabout. I'm not sure who could take those. Emmy? Um, I think the biodiversity net gain, um, that's calculated using a uh, spreadsheet um, calculation. Um, which has a kind of very specific way of calculating it and um, would be the same for the um, road scheme as for any other development. And um, the council's right that 10% is the gain is the target. Um, and condition 15 of the um, SDR application would secure either on-site provision as the first preference, um, but there's a mechanism there to secure the net gain off-site if that can't be achieved, um, which would be through other schemes that the council's delivering on other sites under its control. Um, and I think just to reinforce the point that Judy made about the amount of things that the um, Verge is accommodating, certainly it's something that's been discussed with the landscape officer quite extensively. And I think if you're going to achieve the quality of development, get the trees in and the landscaping and the suds, street lights, um, allow sort of elbow room for cyclists and that sort of thing, if you start chipping away at them, um, they will start to just fail to deliver what they're meant to. Okay, so I think the one remaining point that we haven't had an answer was again this issue relating to the uh, the proposed new access to the properties in Finchester Road off Molly Miller's Lane. Uh, so could somebody take that, please? Sorry, what was that question? Was that about number nine nine six? Uh, 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 just for clarity, Andrew, you're you're, ref you're referring to the uh, the property on Finchester Road closest to the roundabout, which would now have an access out onto Molly Miller's Lane. Is that correct? No, sorry, it's numbers ninety two and ninety four. My apologies. I, yeah, I can't I see. Sorry? So, could you clarify the position for the properties immediately to the east of of the proposed new roundabout? That's ninety four, ninety six. So I I was just saying earlier that the 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 driveway hasn't been specifically shown on the plan, but that doesn't mean that there's an issue there that can't be accommodated. Um, the issue basically is whether the splitter island on the southern approach to the Rhine Spy is going to interfere in any way with uh, manoeuvres out of that driveway. Um, it, it shouldn't, from looking at it. It's not been raised as a, 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 an issue at the, at the stage one road safety audit. Clearly, when the scheme progresses to detailed design, the swept path manoeuvre, if that island needs to shift in a little bit, um, it, it will do. Um, it's 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 not an issue, although I do appreciate that the driveway wasn't specifically shown on the plan. But just to confirm, there's no concern there. 
All right, thank you. I now come on to uh, Abdul Lois. Thank you, Chairman. Um, uh, page 340, paragraph 38, clearly said there is no provision for the GP surgeries. I was wondering if you, if you were to put some ad additional condition, uh, like to add that we do, we do need to have a GP surgeries. And I'd like to say thank you to Cornus to elude us that, that this council will inherit large amount of money. I do not wish to dump 1,500 house in somebody's backyard. And it's been going on as a reserve matter for last, since 2010. It's quite quite difficult to make decision at the moment how things are. But however, um, the time seems to be very little here since it's gonna take something about four or five years. So I'm really um, confused at the moment. I wonder if you could, if Connors could tell us what sort of sums we are looking in if we were to defer this, the council will inherit. Thank you. So I think the quest, first question there was about the provision of uh, doctor's surgeries. And I think I, I can probably answer that myself, which is at the end of the day, that is a matter that is down to the, the CCG, the Clinical Commissioning Group. They, they make decisions on this. We face the same position at the, the larger Arborfield SDL, where their predecessors had said they'd provide a doctor's surgery, and then the CCG decided their model had changed. They wanted surgeries that uh, provided care for much larger areas of the community. So we can make representations, uh, and we certainly have, but it's at the end of the day, it's the clinical commissioning group who decide where doctor's surgeries will be and what areas they cover. Um, so I don't know whether the officers, Connor or the officers, have got anything to add to that. But, yeah, uh, yeah. Uh, and then you could answer the issue about the, the SIL contributions, uh, paying for all the other amenities and services of the proposed new development. Yeah, I mean, Simon, you're correct in the, in the, the CCG NHS uh, surgery issue. Uh, we've had long and uh, long conversations with them about surgeries in Arborfield and everywhere, and, and they, they, that's not their, their model at the moment. Um, so there's nothing we can do in terms of insisting upon a surgery. So we can't put a condition on saying it's going to happen. But as I, I mean, said earlier, the, the community building is flexible enough to allow an outreach centre if, if their model changes in 10 years' time or whatever. Uh, but at the moment, we, we don't have that option. Um, yeah, in terms of the, the, the monies we're talking about, um, so so obviously the redesign of the road is it's not a planning issue so much, but the redesign road would be significantly expensive um, because in essence you're starting again, you have to do the environment, environmental statements again, you have to do um, all the work, the drainage again. So in reality, you're starting again. So from a, a project point of view from the council, um, it, it's spending that money again. I do, I'm not aware of how much the first one cost, but it's millions of pounds we're talking about. Um, the road cost is is hugely significant and it is eating into most of the sale receipts that we would get from this scheme so um any increase in the road costs which would be significant will eat into what the council can provide so the sdls and the, the core strategy was set up to to provide developments that are, are infrastructure rich um high quality um that provide the infrastructure and the services with the development which is what we were lacking before they came about uh, and I think that this, if you look at the STLs, it's, um, it's, it's obvious that they're doing that. They're, you're getting the schools, you're getting the community buildings, you're getting all those things. Um, the more the road costs, the more the other um, services will suffer. There's no question about that because the council doesn't have an infinite supply of money, unfortunately, and the developers don't have to pay for it. So that, 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 that's, uh, that's one of the problems that we face with a road that's, that's massively expensive in the first place. Um, and I think the other costs the council would face are... We are talking about significant delays here. We're not talking about six months a year. Uh, the developers need to go away. The land may not come forward for 10 years. We don't know because there's an implication to the amount of housing that can be provided on it, which means the developers need to relook at how much money, how much profit they're going to make. Um, the landowners need to look at how much profit they're going to make. Um, everything stops, in essence. Um, so I don't know how long it would take, but I would say if you're if you're back here in two two years' time, you're doing pretty well. Um, which has implications to speculative housing sites. And the SDLs have been very good at, at preventing those applications from coming in. We've always kept a housing land supply above what government insists we need to do. Um, so we've been very successful as a council of fighting um, applications on, on sites that come forward which haven't been planned, which aren't appropriate sites, they're not in the right, right locations. So 
The implication of this being delayed, that's probably the main one that people will see. They will get housing developments in their back door is, is the truth, because planning inspectors, their job is to, is to get houses uh, built. Um, so the, up and down the country, you will see developments that aren't particularly well suited, well placed and don't have infrastructure coming with them. And I think we would probably be in that situation. I can't I can't gaze into the future and say that, but it's from my experience, I think that's where we'd be going. Um, so I, I think that's the implication. So there is a balance to be had here from what members need to look at. Um, the balance is, do we want an extra meter either side, uh, which has massive costs? Is it going to cr- create such a good environment? Um, and and when, our, when our previous schemes don't have any safety issues, they don't have, they haven't failed the rate, road safety audits. Um, is that is that worth the balance of, of of what we're we're looking at tonight, which is potentially deferral, which again, th- there's no, I can't give you a timescale of when we'll be back to committee. It won't be next month, I can tell you that. It won't be uh, for a few months yet. So it's all pushing back a, a planned housing scheme. The SPD, uh, this has been going on since 2011. The, the applications, as I said, we've been working on these intensely since two th- well, for the last five years, basically. So it, it's not a short road to get to this point we are now. Uh, and we would not take a scheme to planning committee. I think you're probably aware that we're not happy with it. Um, and um, it meets the standard. It doesn't fail any standards. It doesn't fail um, safety standards on the, on the cycle or pedestrian way. It, it just happens that government has brought out new guidance when we were a long way into this design project and into this project, um, which basically asks for a better um, cycle um, and pedestrian uh, uh, route through through developments, um, but there's no there's no requirement to do that. It is it is guidance, and our policies are for a three meter pedestrian cycle. So actually, our policies trump the guidance, um, and I think they're, they're the issues you need to balance when you're making a decision tonight. Um, I, I don't really have any more to say on that, but if anybody wants to ask me a question, happy to answer. Okay, thank thank you, Connor. Um, Stephen, I think you want to come back. Uh, members, I hope you understand that because of time constraints, we, we it's not going to be possible to take a lot of additional comments. Um, but Stephen, I'll let you come back. Th- uh, thank you very much. Uh, I, I just really wanted to ask Connor uh, for a little bit more detail on this because I, I'm still struggling to get my head around how the whole housing scheme could be jeopardised by half a metre on either side. I mean, that must mean the housing is really crammed in if half a metre either side is going to completely undermine the viability of the housing development. I'm just struggling to see how that could be so. Yeah, I think think the truth is... The truth is, it's not it's not half a meter. It's it's more than that because you have to put in the drainage. You have to do all those things. So it may be half a meter you're looking at, but actually, it's I, I think it's two meters we're talking about on, on, in total on either side. So it's it's quite a lot. You're talking four meters, and I know it doesn't sound a lot in the context of things, but the proving layouts that the developers did that Emmy showed earlier on are based on um, meeting our standards, meeting our policies. So everything shifts that little bit more. Um, there's there's a redesign for them because they have to look at levels again they have to look at everything that they've worked through with us um so they have massive costs the developers will have massive costs imposed upon them they will also have agreed a price for the land with the with the uh, the landowners which is based on a housing number they think they can get um and and we're talking about it, it, it's not it's 15 percent. it's quite a lot because again you have to you have to compensate for the flooding impacts the drainage impacts so that 15 percent is the road that 15 percent isn't everything else that goes with the road um, so, as I say, the floodplain needs to be bigger, the drainage uh, basins need to be bigger. All of these things increase because we're increasing the size of the road. So it's it's not. It sounds very simple, but it's not. I, I can assure you. Um, I've sat in enough highway meetings to be to be uh, knowledgeable a little bit in this, anyway. Okay, thank you, Rochelle. A very quick comment, please. Very quickly, how does 50 centimeters on either side make you move the road? Make move everything by four meters, and you've. We've also been told that you could put it in afterwards. If we put it in afterwards, we'd have to move everything at that point, and it would be considerably more expensive to add 50 centimetres on either side of the road. So it makes much more sense to put it in now. Uh, Rochelle, I think one thing we haven't really covered tonight, but is the the, the term which is new to most of us, is the, the, the what's termed rain gardens, which uh, feature as part of the, the sustainable drainage scheme alongside these roads. And that, that gap serves a purpose in terms of drainage so if you reduce that gap 
the, the availability for drainage altars, which has a knock-on effect to other things. I accept your point that 50 centimetres doesn't look very much when you're talking about a 90-something hectare site. No, not going to take any more on that. We, sorry, we, sorry, we, sorry. Need, we, we need to make some progress. Connor? Sorry, I was just going to jump in. I don't, I'm not sure where this 50 centimetres is coming from. Um, in essence, you're talking about actually five metres. So you're talking about three metres for cyclists plus two metres for pedestrians. So it's, it's, it's increasing everything. It's not, I don't know where 50 centimetres has come from, I have to say. But. Okay, right. Members, um, I think everybody has had a say. Chris, were you indicating I'll briefly as vice chairman? I'll let you come back very Thank briefly. Thank you. Um, <laughs> however, however admirable these schemes uh, may be, and they could be very good, as you said at the beginning, we're not here to modify schemes. We can't do that. The only way to uh, get the council to change its mind on the uh, way the road works is to refuse this application. And there is no safety problem, from what I've heard, on having a non-segregated a non uh, pedestrians and cyclists. So I can't see any reason to refuse the application, at least in that respect. Right. Members, we need to start making some decisions now. So, um, I, I, Emmy, uh, as the, the main case officer on this, it was proposed to take these decisions in a particular order. Uh, but is there any advantage in that at the moment, or should we just simply take these votes and decisions in the order that they appear in the agenda? Um, any comments, please, from Connor or Emmy? I think the reason we recommended the order we did is because the housing is reliant on the delivery of the road and the SANG, um, and the recommendation does say that the a recommendation to grant planning permission for the housing applications is dependent on those two applications having been determined first. Okay, and that's that's what we'll do. So, members, um, the easy one to start with. Um, Item 75, the footpath diversions. Uh, so, yeah, that's we've already agreed. I'd say the easy one to be done first. So, so the next one we come on to, the, the sequence the officers were suggesting, was the uh, item 77, followed by item 78, followed by item 80, followed by 79, and finally 76. Uh, Carl, just want to make a quick point about the, the, the possible condition on making that. Uh, you, you've remembered that, yeah, and then we'll come to that on that one. Yeah, yeah when, okay. we, when we come to that one, that just, was just that <laughs> even if we had, it may not be word perfect, but if we had uh, perhaps uh, Connor and Emmy, you could be thinking about that uh, when we get to the, um, the issue about the roundabout, that we want some kind of condition. I uh, appreciate it will probably need more work, but I want an, um, an unequivocal condition about the provision of a pedestrianised, sorry, a signalised pedestrian crossing south of the current proposed new three-arm roundabout. Is that understood? Yes. Thank you. Right. Okay. So, members, uh, first one we come to is the land south of Wokingham east of Finchipstead Road and west of Waterloo Road. Now, this relates to the South Wokingham Distributor Road. Um, we've heard a lot from the officers to justify the perceived shortcomings that members have drawn to our attention. Um, now, firstly, Stephen, I would invite you, did you wish to put an alternative proposal forward because you gave clear indications you were minded to so do? I am minded to do the same, as I suggested earlier. I am very aware that there is a cost, and I'm very aware that this is a difficult issue. Um, we, we clearly uh, can interpret uh, LTN 120 uh, in lots of different ways, but its core principle seems to be separation, and we haven't achieved that here. Uh, and I would like us to explore ways in which we could achieve separation between uh, cyclists and pedestrians. So, let's, let's get clarity. Are, are you suggesting then that, are you proposing a deferral 
for more work, or are you proposing a refusal? Well, I would prefer, prefer to propose a, a deferral for more work. Okay. Um, okay, well, briefly, could we have the officer react? I think we probably know the officer's reaction. That, that is something they would wish to avoid at all costs. Uh, because of the implications for the rest of the application. So uh, I think first thing then is, I think we just simply go with a, a, your proposed deferral. If you, is, who's going to second that? Right, so we'll have to firstly put a deferral to the boat. If, if that is successful, obviously we know where we stand. If it's not successful, we will then revert to the original application and have to take a vote on that. So, members, I think it's very clear what is in front of you. Uh, Stephen Conway is proposing a deferral for more work to address very specific concerns about the shared use of, uh, of the road. Uh, and uh, we are, you are asking that officers come back with a revised scheme. Uh, and against that background, we understand that officers are uh, alarmed by that and it's not something they would want to do at this stage because of its knock-on implications and the fact that the failure to be able to deliver a South Working MSDL will inevitably have uh, implications for speculative development elsewhere in the borough which has been quite well controlled over the last eight years. So, Chairman, can I just get some advice please? Yeah. Um, obviously I'm not voting on 77 or 76. Correct. Um, with the deferral, I presume it's the deferral of 77, in which case I will not vote on that either. That's correct. That's correct. Okay. So, members, um, Stephen Conway has proposed a deferral. That's supported by Rochelle Shepherd of Bay. Could members who wish to support a deferral please show? That is three votes. Uh, those members against a deferral please show. And that is five votes. So I'm afraid a deferral has not been successful. So, members, we now come on to the substantive item that we have in front of us. Uh, and that application is, we've, we've talked at uh, great length on this. So I would ask members whether you are prepared to support uh, the planning application listed in the agenda on item 76, which is application 203-535. Could, sorry? Sorry, my, my, my apologies. My apologies. I'm getting word blind here. Planning application 192928, which is the South Wokingham Distributor Road. Could members who wish to support this please indicate? That's supported by five members. So the South Wokingham Distributor Road is carried. Thank you, members. Probably worth still taking the against. Yeah, we have to take the against votes. Um, could those members that didn't support it, uh, firstly, are there any of those members who wish to abstain? Well, yes, we knew you were saying to. And the members who were actually against that proposal is three. Thank you very much, members. So we now move on to uh, planning application 78, I think, next. Uh, sorry, item 78, which I, I hope is whilst there's been a couple of reservations expressed about it, which is the SANG. Um, could members please indicate, uh, firstly, I'm assuming no member wishes to offer a, an attempt to refuse the SANG. So members, could you please indicate whether you're prepared to support 190900, the proposed new SANG located at St Anne's Manor. Could you please vote now? And I think that is unanimous. So that is approved unanimously. Thank you, members. Um, we now come on to item 80, which is the housing, uh, something we've heard very little about over the last four hours. Um, the, this is the development 2B, which is for 1,434 homes. It's a hybrid application uh, submitted by uh, Keir and Miller. Um, members, would you please indicate? Uh, Chairman, I sorry. think... We add conditions that are in the update. Sorry? Conditions in the update. Yes, sorry. We, we do need to add the conditions in the update. Members, you've all had your members update. They are fairly straightforward, non-controversial, minor amendments and adjustments. Thank you, Angus, for pointing that out. So, um, firstly, am I correct in assuming no member wishes to propose a refusal of this? In that case, we go to the substantive item. 
and that is could members please indicate whether they will support item 191068 uh, for phase I think it's term 2b of the South Wokingham SDL and that is universally supported or unanimously supported sorry thank you members and next we come on to item 79 which is the phase a development uh, for Kingacre, uh, and that is for a smaller number of units, 215 homes. And that is application 190914. Could members please indicate? I believe uh, there are also conditions. There are also and conditions connected. Sorry, the conditions apply on all of the members' updates. I think we hopefully take those as read. But thank you for correcting that, Angus. Um, so on item 79, that's 190914. Again, does any member wish to re uh, recommend an alternative proposal? For us to consider? I see no one indicating, in which case we go to the substantive item. Could members please indicate whether they support planning application 190914? And again, that is unanimously carried. Thank you, members. And we now come on to item 76, which is the land at the junction of Finchamstead Road and Molly Miller's Lane. Uh, the th new three-arm roundabout. I'm going to ask officers, have you come up with some appropriate wording to add to the conditions here, please? Um, I would suggest something along the lines that before the development hereby approved comes into use, a toucan crossing shall be provided on Finch Hampstead Road between the application site and Tangley Drive in accordance with details that have first been submitted to and approved in writing by the local planning authority. Um, I'm going to ask you to go through that one more time slowly, please. Sorry. Before the development hereby approved comes into use, a toucan crossing shall be provided on Finch Hampstead Road between the application site and Tangley Drive in accordance with details that have first been submitted to and approved in writing by the local planning authority. Are members satisfied with that, that that um, confirms that, that specific point? Silence. What about silence? Sorry, please don't interrupt. Right, um, mem members, uh, is that a satisfactory condition? A number of you expressed concerns. I'm looking to those that were specifically expressing concerns about it. Does that condition help? I, I, I appreciate it. I appreciate it's not. I appreciate it's not perfect for you, but does that help, Stephen? It, it, it does help, but I am still concerned that we're going to get pedestrians trying to cross nearer the roundabout which will be the more logical desire line for many. Um, and the issue about sight lines that the gentleman just mentioned is relevant in that case, I think. Okay. One way we could add an informative requesting officers review that issue. Would that be something? I, that I'd be happy if we did that. I think that's probably the best way forward. We've okay. already had an indication um, from uh, Judy that... Uh, some tweaking of the scheme would be possible right. um, in order to accommodate if there's any difficulty for uh, number 96 Finch Hampstead Road uh, accessing. So if that same opportunity to tweak can be used here for those sight lines, I would be happy with that. Could we have that as an informative added to our existing list of informatives? Yeah. Uh, Connor, have you got appropriate wording? Callum, sorry, have you got appropriate wording there? that either of you no okay uh, would you just like to repeat that okay sorry okay um to get it I, right i would like an informative that enabled us to um uh, make clear that because we believe that the uh, desired route of many pedestrians will actually be to cross where the existing um uh, or the, to be removed uh, crossing Yes, it is. Yeah. Um, we need to improve the sight lines there to recognise that uh, that is likely to continue to be a route that's used by pedestrians. Right. Angus? I just wonder, before, before Judy comes back, just as to whether this would be covered under a safety audit. I mean, I'm not against the informative, but the basic, the basis of this surely would be a safety audit. OK. Um, Judy? Very that's, briefly, absolutely, that's absolutely correct, yes. And Condition 3 does require um, highway construction details to be approved, which has a list of uh, minor tweaks already identified, so I would anticipate it should just be added to that Condition 3. Okay. 
Stephen, happy with that? Right. It can be dealt with under condition three, that's fine. Okay, all right. Well, I, I will ask, uh, although I will ask that the, the, that condition, um, hopefully, uh, I would ask that Connor, uh, Connor, could you revert to me tomorrow uh, with an appropriate, specific, detailed, worded condition? We can, yeah. Right, yeah. thank you. Right. All right. So, uh, members, we, we now come on to that application. Um, firstly, Stephen, uh, did you wish to propose a refusal against this? No, I think uh, I've got as much as uh, we're likely to be able to get. Okay. Right. Thank you. In that case, members, I would ask for your support for planning application, uh, let me get my terminology correct, 203535, which is the proposed new three-arm roundabout at Molly Millers Lane, along with a condition relating, specific condition relating to the introduction of a toucan crossing to the immediate, to, to the south of that location, the precise wording to be checked and approved by me tomorrow. Um, and of course, the other comments that were included in the members update. So all clear on that. So members, could I please ask whether you're able to support planning application 203535. And that is not unanimous. Thank you, members. Um, and is anyone wishing to abstain? And is anyone wishing to vote against? Thank you. Members, that means that application all those applications we've considered at significant length tonight have now all been approved. Thank you for your forbearance on a very long meeting. Um, I think the strength of feeling about some matters has been well aired, and I hope that uh, officers will do their best to ensure that the final scheme we have uh, is further tweaked to the benefit of all users beyond what we've seen tonight. So, um, could we stop recording now, please? I don't know who's sorting that out. Uh, Dave Clifton, can you just confirm verbally when the stream's ended, please? Sorry, that was very quick.